Brian Chung and Brooke De Palma to take a closer look at these numbers with us. Perhaps first and foremost, Brian, when we think about the headline number here and what we're seeing in parts this with the Fed, because that's the big decision going forward from here, what rate hikes might still look like from the Fed. And Powell, we've already heard that his concern is whether or not the effects of the policy decisions had actually been ingested by the economy. Does this start to show us a little bit of that? Yeah, well, let's take a step back and just kind of unpack the report as a whole. Again, inflation, not just in the eye of the Federal Reserve, but in the eye of the American people, cooling when you compare it to the June report at 8.5% on a year-over-year -year basis. That's how much prices grew in America. But on a month-over-month -month basis, it actually was essentially unchanged, which, yes, it's good. That might be cooling. But look, 8.5% is still very high. And even when you remove those more volatile components of prices in America, like, for example, food and energy, what they call the core CPI, that number came in at 5.9% on a year-over-year -year basis, low, lower than the headline, but still high. Although, keep in mind, the street actually expected 6.1% on a year-over-year -year basis in the month of July. Now, when we unpack what's going on here, one big reason for a cooler report compared to June is because of a decline in energy prices. So again, when you take a look, for example, at gasoline, down 7.7%. Fuel oil, down 11%. A big reversal of what we saw earlier in the year into the early parts of the summer. Food, we're going to talk about that in a second. Up 1.1% still, though. That probably matches what Americans are feeling at the grocery store. But look, a lot of the reopening travel plays, declining a lot. Hotels and motels down 3%. Airline fares down almost 8%. Car and truck rentals down 9.5%. But Rent and mortgages, those starting to bleed through into inflation as well. Not a positive story on that front, up 0.6% on a month-over-month -month basis. That's a very sticky component of inflation. Things that got cheaper, major appliances, clothing, things that got more expensive, new vehicles and alcohol. So again, a mixed report overall, but still important to note that it's a cooling from June that might be good for the Fed, doesn't knock them off the path of more rate hikes in the All right, so let's talk about the food component in particular, because that saw an increase, as you pointed out, still not like all of the fuel components that are falling. Brooke, you're digging into the food side. Yeah, absolutely. But consumers can still expect to see some sticker shock when they get to the grocery store of food year over year is up a whopping 13.1%. That's higher than May, April, June. Those numbers relative to 9 to 10% up there. From June to July, that cost of food at home increased by 1.4%. Now, one of the highest categories we saw was cereal and bakery products. That's 15% year over year. Meat and poultry up 10.9%. Now, the high the highest increase there was offset by eggs, are up a whopping 38% year over year. That's up from June, 4.3%. Now, I did speak to an economist before we jumped on. And he said that eggs have been a relatively volatile index prior to the pandemic. And to get this, he said that he heard that weather can have a huge, a huge effect on how many eggs that these chickens mm. can produce. Now, if you take a look at some categories that also jumped, he emphasized coffee as well as non-alcoholic beverages. Year over year, coffee saw a 20% jump. Non-alcoholic beverages, of course, that includes carbonated drinks, jumped a whopping 13.8%. Of course, Oranges still in focus there, up 14% year over year. So consumers still getting hit at the grocery store. Wait, I, I just had an idea to solve your <laughs> no. egg problem, Brian. No. Oh, oh, no. I knew it was coming. <laughs> laying hens? Is it time to buy some laying hens? I'm not laying <laughs> hens. In my, I have no backyard to lay hens. Do you have a ba balcony? No, no balcony you to lay hens. But I want to fish tank with a heat lamp. Uh, right. I Well, time now for our Yahoo You, and we want to talk about the housing component of the inflation report. But how exactly does the hot housing market bleed into the inflation numbers that we keep blabbering about? So time for a little summer school classes in session, and we're talking about headline inflation first. Again, that big number coming in this morning, 8.5% on a year-over-year -year basis is what we're looking at. And indeed, that did show a bit of a slowdown. It's very small from the pace that we had in July, or rather in June, which was 9%. But what we're looking at here is the headline figure, right? This includes everything, food, energy, housing. But the consumer price index says that roughly a third of this measure is actually on where you sleep for the night, which means that shelter is a major driver of prices, which begs the question, how does the CPI calculate that? So shelter 
as defined by the government statistics agency that puts this together, is anything that's really a roof over your head. So in addition to your literal home, it's also going to include hotels, motel lodging. But what we really care about here is the rent of primary residence and also owner's equivalent rent of residences. And essentially what that means is that rent is a survey of, well, if you're paying 1000 or $1,500 a month, that's what you put when the owner, uh, when the survey comes around to you. But owner's equivalent rent of residences is essentially how they calculate home ownership. So if you own your home and you mortgage it out, the survey asks you if you were to rent out your home without anything inside of it, how much could you get for that? So it's essentially taking home ownership or mortgages and trying to equate it to what a monthly rent might be. And it's also important to remember that those don't factor in homeowners insurance, which by the way is broken out separately. So again, homeownership, not renting, this one right here is actually the majority of shelter in CPI. So let's see what that looks like against the overall inflation story. Blue line here is owner's equivalent rent. The purple line is all items in the US in the US cities. And it's a very interesting trend because the prices have gone up in the overall CPI as the purple line shows, right? But the blue line is not at eight or nine percent. But overall, the story is still the same. It's going up. What's actually very interesting here is the timing of all of this, because the increase that we've seen in the overall CPI began in 2020, but it didn't really begin for uh, owner's equivalent rent until 2021. So, so what's going on with the lag that lasted almost about a year? Well, the reason is that a hot housing market takes time to bleed into the inflation statistics. So for example, even though home prices we know for a fact began rising in 2020, it takes time for homeowners to close on the house, actually get into their homes, and then actually get all the things they need inside of them, like fridges, right? There's a lot of supply chain issues that we've had for the last two years. And homeowners who are asked, well, how much could you rent your home for may not have caught up with the housing trends on what they could actually rent for until sometime after because they were so busy actually trying to move into them. So all of this is a reason why Goldman Sachs warns that the shelter component of CPI should continue to run hot even if other price categories fall, which is something to think about as we continue to watch inflation reports through the next few months. And that's it for this week's Yahoo! You. Well, the cost of food at home increased 13.1% in the month of July, but many consumers are now concerned about the size of the products they're purchasing, also known as shrinkflation. Brooke De Palma here to break it all down. Brooke, you went out to grocery stores. You saw it. How, what kind of shrink, what kind of decline are we talking about? Yeah, well, it's actually not a new phenomenon. It rose to popularity earlier this summer when the pricing of these products are just continuing to rise year over year and consumers are questioning what exactly they're paying for here. And so it was a term uh, coined by a British economist nearly a decade ago. And the exact definition there is a situation when the price of a product stays the same, but its size gets smaller. Now, when I spoke to an economist at the Bureau of Labor, statistics. He emphasized this is not a new phenomenon. It's something that's been going on for a long time. And it really rose popularity during the pandemic when people were buying more consumer products there. And also, too, it's something that the BLS does, in fact, account for. So, for example, you see orange juice. It used to be 64 ounces. Now it's only 59 ounces. That does get factored into the average price data there. I did notice my Girl Scout cookies were a little light in the box this year, so that's definitely true. So, Brooke, where exactly, though, are we seeing this shrinkflation happening? Yeah, so when I spoke to that economist, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, he emphasized that we're seeing in a lot of household products like paper towels as well as toilet paper. But I spoke to one consumer advocate, longtime advocate there, Edgar Dworsky. He's the founder of ConsumerWorld.org, and he really, uh, you know, researches this stuff day to day. And he said that in times of high inflation, when the cost of products like cereal and bakery products, today we saw that category up 15 percent, consumers pay closer attention to it. But once again, happening for a long time time there. But he did say that brands basically respond to these higher costs in three different ways. They either fix the sizing, they change the ingredients, or they increase the pricing there. Now, in most cases, what we're seeing is that change in size of products. It just makes the most sense in order to get these products out efficiently and also not change up something that consumers already know and love. And now he also runs a site called mouseprint.com where consumers actually send in what they're seeing. And so I do want to point to two examples here. First, we have a, a package of Utz pretzels. Now, what we saw there is a 28-ounce 
package went down to 26 ounces. Now, I did reach Utz. They did not respond with a comment. Another example is PepsiCo's Quaker cereal. Now, this is really interesting here. So the giant size was 24.8 ounce. It almost looks like it's smaller in size, but then they introduced it as a family size, 22.3 ounces. And I spoke to another expert at the University of Illinois, Sheldon Jacobson, and he called it like a magic show. So what these companies will do is they'll reintroduce a product with a different name, a different style packaging so that the consumers seamlessly think that they're actually winning more here, getting a bigger package, a family size, a giant size, when in actuality, they're yeah. getting less in that package. I feel like I'm getting tricked right into it. I hadn't <laughs> noticed, by the way, toilet paper, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. one that I have, you just look at the price tag and you think what you're getting. Like, yeah. this didn't cost this much. Yeah. What does that ultimately mean for the consumer? They're already paying higher prices because of inflation. Now they're getting less for their money. Mm -hmm. What's the breakdown? Well, the solution really here is that consumers are aware of it even after inflation cools down in the price, in the food sector, that is. Because by consumers being educated on what they're buying, mm -hmm. then there'll be more, you know, backlash perhaps to these companies producing these products. But in many cases, especially with that toilet paper one, these big names are ultimately saying that, no, 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 actually, you know, you are still getting more. You're still getting more bang for your buck. You're still getting more sheets per roll. And so in that case, by consumers sort of raising the bar here, making a stand and sticking to it even after inflation cools down, Perhaps we'll see a change there. Perhaps we'll go back to those huge king-size Reese's or, or Hershey bars that we saw a long time ago that still are around, but maybe it costs a little more. Time to go to Costco, right, Michelle? <laughs> Got to make a run to that's, Costco, That's Rochelle. right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. A big thank you there, Brooke, there, discussing all of this. And as I was mentioning, when I got my Girl Scout cookies this year, I was quite disappointed at how light the boxes felt. Meanwhile, the prices had actually ticked up mm -hmm. for some of those products. I mean, it does make sense when you see some of these input costs sugar and labor and things that the prices go up. But the honesty in the marketing is what I take an issue with. Just, just let us know what's happening. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right about that. Just don't introduce it as a new product, right? I mean, we have heard a lot of these companies talk about that, you know, on their call where they are seeing cost prices go up. They are increasing their prices as well. The sizing of the product, we haven't necessarily heard. Obviously, if you look at those photos Brooke just shared, pretty noticeable, even if it's a tiny, tiny difference. And there's only just a, a few brands that are keeping prices the same. We've had the Arizona Ice Tea CEO on before, and he said he's going to keep his prices at a dollar. And that's even despite the cost of aluminium going up, the cost of sugar, high fructose corn syrup going up, keeping the prices the same. So we really do have to be vigilant when we're sort of going through. Because I know I was looking at the, the family size versus uh, that other large size that they had. I noticed that with my Rice Krispies. I, I didn't care for that. I, I don't know. I, I stick to Trader Joe's. <laughs> I don't know where you go grocery shopping, Rochelle, but... I mean, I'm imagining they're doing the same. I'm going to go today, probably be a little more vigilant, but I haven't seen these changes just yet, at least in what I see. Today's CPI data bringing some relief with inflation cooling a bit from its peak in June. So what does that mean for investors? Well, for more, we turn now to the ETF think tank director of research, Cynthia Murphy, who joins us for this week's ETF report brought to you by Invesco QQQ. Good to have you back, Cynthia. So in this environment, where are you seeing investors pouring into with ETFs? You know, that's a great question because uh, it seems like the tone completely changed today. So up until yesterday, the story was all about hedging that risk, finding safety and being really preparing for what makes sense to be invested in if this really is a recession. Where today, you know, all it took was a little bit of good news and this inflation number that people perceived as positive to really change the tone. Today was all about growth, tech, risk, 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 as much as you can get. So it's kind of interesting to see just how hungry investors have been for good news. And they took it and they ran with it. And today was all about the growth risk and, and risk that we haven't really seen appetite for all year. Uh, Cynthia, there, there's no other ETF that symbolizes risk more than ARK, right? We even talk about it a lot because of the big pullback we've seen up more than 6% today. And sure, it's off of the economic data we got this morning, but you know, in terms of strategy for those who maybe have been hit hard by some of these tech ETFs, is now really the time to get in? 
Yes, I mean, that's the million dollar question, Akiko. In, in truth, I mean, ARC is really for the believers. And it's amazing that no matter what happens to that fund, no matter what Kathy Wood comes out and say, uh, the followers are there, the investors are super sticky in this fund. Now, just yesterday, Kathy Wood was quoted as saying, we are already in a recession and we're going to be out of it by early next year. Well, if that's the case, then, you know, maybe people are ready to start bracing in for the bounce we're going to see in growth and tech and disruption because these are the most beaten down parts of the market this year but you know do you believe that i mean so the inflation number was great today relatively speaking because we were expecting much worse in reality it's still high it's still affecting really sticky parts of the economy and it is, is it suggesting that the fed all of a sudden is going to cut rates ahead absolutely not so it could be that this is a one day bounce it could be that it lasts a little bit longer but i think that's what everybody wants to see what we do know is that today if you look at the vix index which really is that fear indicator of the s p 500 it's down 10 percent as an index which is a huge drop so Today, everybody's feeling much better about taking on risk, about buying in funds like ARK, uh, but one day doesn't make a trend. We'll have to see if this lasts seven days, 10 days, if it's here to stay or if it's just going to be a one day event. And speaking of risk, we're seeing obviously some of these crypto tokens rallying and some of these blockchain related stocks. But what is your take on investing on those in terms of ETFs? So what's cool about the, the blockchain, the crypto ETF space specifically, is that the number of funds is still growing in the segment. So like everything else related to crypto, related to, to disruption, to technology, they have been out of favor. These funds have been really beaten down. Market performance has been brutal on anything that touches the space this year. But product innovation is still happening there. There's still new funds coming out into the space, trying to offer different ways to access blockchain, different cryptocurrencies, the digital infrastructure. So, you know, the what I think is interesting, does that tell you that it, as an industry, we believe that there's potential here for growth and it's coming soon because it costs money to launch an ETF. And if issuers are launching these funds now, it's because they think they can attract assets. They're only going to attract assets if these things are going to perform. So I'm really actually curious to see if this is the beginning of a new wave of growth in this segment, or if the market is going to keep punishing these stocks until we're out of the whole recession talk and, and rate hike phase. Uh, Cynthia, another type of ETF we've been watching really closely probably a good measure of the risk appetite out there. And that is the single stock ETFs that are leveraged bets against companies that are already highly volatile, Tesla, Coinbase, just to name a few. What kind of inflows are you seeing there? And how do you think investors should be playing this right now? That's another really, really puzzling space right now because that is all about risk and it's about doubling down on risk, which has not been a theme we've, a theme we've seen this year. Uh, you know, in terms of are these assets coming into these funds sticky, it's too soon to tell, but volume is there. So investors are really using these ETFs to trade, whether they are really bullish on a stock or bearish on that stock, because you can do a bull or a bear play on a lot of these stocks. And but, you know, they're they're meant as short term tactical tools. So we see a lot of coming in and getting out very quickly of these things. So it's still kind of early on, but it's kind of fascinating that the riskiest type of ETF would come out at a time when risk has been so out of favor. So it, it's kind of a, a fascinating move in the ETF world. But we keep seeing launches. Another eight launched yesterday, and there's several in registration. I think we just started scratching the surface. There's so many more to come. And they all offer different types of leverage you can you can use. So it will be a lot of hedging ahead, probably, with these things. Yeah, it is fascinating to see how quickly uh, that has grown. Uh, Cynthia Murphy, ETF Think Tank Director of Research. Appreciate the time today. Well, for more on what's happening with the markets, let's bring in Insignio Chief Investment Officer Ahmed Riasco and Oxford, Chief, and Oxford Economics Chief U.S. Financial Economist Kathy Bosjancic. Thank you both for being here. So first, I want to start with you, Kathy. In terms of the economic environment, with this latest data added in, what should we be? How should we be characterizing how the U.S. economy is doing right now? Well, thank you. I'm happy to be on with you uh, today. Uh, you know, it's it's. A unique business cycle. So the numbers uh, at times can be a bit confusing, um, but what we're seeing is that um, inflation pressures are easing. 
Um, and, and it's mostly on the goods sector. Uh, as you said earlier, you know, the core service um, side of the equation still looks quite sticky to us. And that's really being led by higher rental, residential rent um, uh, prices. Um, yes, hotel prices were off, car rental prices were off, but, but in general, the core service prices is something that we're watching closely. So the inflation picture is getting better. It's going in the right direction. The overall economy is slowing. Labor market still remains really strong. And just one last point, bringing that back to the inflation picture, if you look at wages, especially um, services, um, uh, jobs, the wage growth is still quite strong. That's going to have a good correlation with core service prices. So that's something we have to keep in mind. And I, you know, we're not we're not done yet. We can't call you know victory on inflation. Yeah, Ahmed, let's talk about uh, the market reaction. You heard Kathy there say that we're not out of the woods just yet. Yet, when you look at the reaction today, there seemed to be some relief, at least in the number, that it didn't tick higher than expected. How did you view it in the market context? Yeah, I mean, we think actually the market reaction is pretty in line with what we've been saying. We've actually been pretty sanguine on the U.S. outlook. Uh, we've been pretty adamant saying that we're not in a recession in the United States, despite the two consecutive GDP <laughs> prints, uh, primarily because of the strength of the labor market, and that's still quite robust. So we continue to see gross domestic income in the United States quite uh, uh, quite high, uh, definitely not in negative territory, perhaps not as robust as it was earlier in the year. I think what the market is cheering right now is sort of it's taking kind of the worst case scenario for the Fed, or at least the Fed rate hikes off, where we are disagreeing with the market. And we think the market might have sort of swung too far in the opposite direction. The market's already pricing in 50 basis points of rate cuts into 2023. And precisely because we see the U.S. economy in relatively good footing going forward, and we do see inflation coming down, uh, mostly because of decreasing margin costs and, and rising like inventory levels, we don't think the Fed's going to be able to, uh, to cut as much as the market's currently expecting. So that could lead to some volatility down the line. We're looking at perhaps more in 2023. But for the rest of the year, we're pretty sanguine on the outlook. And Kathy, obviously consumers happy to see gas prices at the pump continuing to tick down at around $4, just slightly over $4 a gallon right now. And also, obviously, oil prices are still continuing to tick down. How enthusiastic should we be, though, about this trend? Is this one that you expect to continue or are we perhaps unprepared for some surprises ahead? Well, we, we think that it will continue um, if you look at uh, futures prices uh, for 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 gasoline and oil, it does look like we're, you know, on a downward trend. But you're right; we, at any given moment, month or any unseen exogenous shock could send prices soaring again. So we do have to be careful there. But um, I, I do think we're going to get some reprieve. I, I think the big question is on the food um, category, and if food prices continue to soar higher. Uh, we're up almost 11 percent year in year for food prices. That's the fastest pace since. You know, 1979. Um, you know, is the consumer going to get some reprieve there? Um, and and there's some indications that may happen, but it's going to be a little bit more delayed relative to where you know commodity prices, which have already fallen. Uh, but if food prices come off, that's really going to be another uh, boost to consumers. And I think we're going to see consumer sentiment, confidence measures start to get a bit of a lift and come off of the the lows that we've seen. Um, and that, that certainly can help and it help with purchasing power, right? And help stabilize the economy. And we're a little less rosy on the outlook for next year. We don't think recession is baked into the cards, but we do see economic growth continuing to slow. And we think by the end of next year, actually, we do think the Federal Reserve will be lowering rates pretty aggressively because inflation will be lower and economic growth as well. I mean, when you think about uh, the sectors hit hardest on this expectation of more aggressive rate hikes, obviously high growth tech names getting hit. We've seen some of that money flowing back in today. Tech, one of those sectors that's leading the way. Are we starting to see that debate growth versus value kind of reverse or is it too soon to make that shift in your portfolio? Yeah, we think it's too soon. I mean, there is obviously an opportunity for short term bounce for growth and growth factor style equities. But if you look at historical valuation metrics, it's still quite expensive versus value. Uh, historically, growth tends to you know, trade at around a 54, 55% premium to value. That got as high as to 130% uh, just six months ago. We're only down to about 90% there. So if you look at historical levels, 
it's still expensive. So I still think, if anything, this is a good opportunity to sell out of growth with this recent bounce and keep uh, uh, tilting further into the value space, which still remains historically cheap versus growth. And Ahmed, just a quick follow-up there. In terms of any sectors that you're starting to rotate out of, what's on the agenda there? Well, uh, we are looking more than anything to buy into some dips that we've had in some of these prices, like even the commodity complex, um, the energy sector, which has come off the boil a bit. Um, we think that we're sort of in the early stages of a long-term multi-year commodity super cycle. And it really has nothing to do with the demand side. It has simply to do with the supply side. Most commodity markets, with a few exceptions, such as uh, like iron ore, most of them are in physical deficits. And we really don't see these being resolved anytime soon. So we think the drift in commodity prices will continue upward in a multi-year horizon. So we're looking to add there. Um, we're also looking to add generally in sectors uh, that have high dividend, high income grow, uh, stocks, because we think those are the ones that tend to, to, to perform better in a high inflationary environment, which unfortunately we think we're going to be in for quite some time. Inflation is not going to be at the levels we saw earlier this year. But I do not see it dipping down to the two, two and a quarter percent long term Fed comfort level anytime soon. So we think that those stocks will continue to outperform. But first, let's start off with a look at markets. Akiko. And it is looking green across the board, Rochelle. One hour left to go in the trading day. And we are seeing a rally here, not quite at the highs that we saw early on in the session, but still the Dow up more than 400 points. The S&P 500 up 71 and the Nasdaq up 305. We are seeing full on risk on mode in the markets today. Let's take a look at the sectors here. Uh, those that are leading the gains today, tech a big one. We're also seeing materials up in a big way communication services. And of course, we've been tracking the bond yields. We saw the two-year, the shorter end of the yield curve, pull back in a big way on the back of that CPI data you just mentioned, Rochelle, coming in weaker than expected. That's a good thing on a day like today. And let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Brian Chung. Of course, Brian, we saw those yield moves on the back of this expectation now that the Fed may not have to move as aggressively. What's yeah. the expectation? I mean, we still have a long way to go until the next meeting. It's, there's going to be another CPI report and another jobs report before we get to that next Fed meeting. But we've seen bond markets blink in response to that inflation report this morning. Uh, we were showing the 10-year uh, bond yield. I want to show you, though, the movement across the morning because we're at about 2.79%. That's only a basis point lower than where we ended the day yesterday. But if you take a look at the two-day basis, again, this was after hours, nothing happening there. Boom! What's going on? It dropped to as low as actually 2.67% bounced back. So originally we were down much lower on the 10-year, which could re reflect because this is a proxy of Fed interest rates in the future that maybe the Fed doesn't have to get as aggressive to take inflation down. Maybe they could get away for, with, for example, a 50 basis point hike in the next meeting in September. Again, uh, Fed markets are now pricing in about a 60% chance that they'll go with a 50 basis point move as opposed to the 75 basis point move that they were factoring in and majority favoring uh, prior to today's inflation report. But broadly speaking, I want to show you what overall markets are thinking about that inflation report. Take a look at the VIX. This is often called the fear index below a 20 handle for, by the way, the first time since about April. And what this tells you is that maybe there's a little bit, a little bit more certainty in the markets. And I think that the settlement that we've seen in still an inverted but kind of settling yield curve does show you that perhaps markets are getting a little bit clearer clarity into exactly how the Fed might move again about six weeks from now. So, Brian, as we look a little further down the road in terms of next steps in this fight against inflation, things like the balance sheet and some of these long term inflation expectations, what are we expecting? You have some stickier things, as we saw in terms of inflation still going up a lot for shelter and service costs. Yeah. And I think that when we talk about the overall inflation picture and I actually I might have an element in here loaded up from uh, the previous show, just talking about inflation and shelter, as you mentioned, uh, owners equivalent rent of residences in U.S. cities, the blue line here, the purple line is overall headline inflation. But you can actually see it's continuing to go up. And this is relevant because we know that mortgages are getting more expensive, but it's still very much by all intents and purposes, a very hot housing market. And again, we haven't seen any letting up of the amount that people are paying as a result of their overall consumption basket to just putting a roof over their heads. So again, that's going to be a very interesting story to look at as we get towards the August, September, October reports. But you did see things like airline tickets, hotel motel fare, 
other types of travel types of expenditures actually fall in the month of July, those could be very good to bring inflation back down. But again, this is a major component, about 30% of overall CPI. So if this isn't going down, then maybe overall headline inflation can only get down to a certain level. Well, July's consumer price index showed inflation slowing down more than Wall Street expected, but prices for food continuing to climb. Yeah, finance is Brooke De Palma here with us, and that includes food away from home, right? That's right, Brian. Well, prices of food away from home are up 7.6% year over year. Now, that's an increase from June. That's up 0.7% from June, but that actually outpaces the cost of food at home. Well, food at home rather outpaces the cost of food away from home. So food at home, that's groceries, things that you just pick up in the store. That's up 13.1%, up from July 1.4%. So the big question here is, are consumers going to head to fast food chains over just going to the grocery store to pick up their food when those prices are higher than just grabbing a burger at, say, McDonald's. Well, that's a really good point because I've experienced this myself. I've gone to the store and taken a look at a price of chicken thighs, and I'm like, mm. with all the ingredients, maybe I should just go over to the fast food spot across the street. Is that happening? What are the prices looking at for fast food restaurants? Yeah, well, we're hearing a lot of that in these earnings call with uh, major CEOs, of course. Wendy's, Todd Pentagor coming on shortly. They said that consumers may be putting one less item in the bag, but nothing major there. Chipotle CFO Jack Hartunk told Yahoo Finance that they're taking another price hike of 4% in August. Of course, their upper income consumers, are, which make up about 60% of Chipotle's customer base, have not changed their ha buying habits, but they are seeing a little softness in consumers with an income of under 75000 Now, I do want to emphasize on a call, um, McDonald's CFO, um, Kevin Ozon there, saying that we're seeing some trade down. We're seeing customers, and specifically lower income customers, trade down to value offers and fewer combo meals. Of course, McDonald's making a big push with their loyalty program, looking to get customers to spend more, put more items in the bag with that new rewards program. Sweet Green also lowered its 2022 forecast with weaker sales that have begun around Memorial Day now. On a different note, Bloomin' Brands uh, saying that we don't see customers managing their checks at this point. Of course, that's behind Outback, State, Outback Steakhouse and Caramba's Italian Grill. In fact, they said that we're seeing continued trade up, and so that's been really strong for us. Starbucks also seeing high demand. They were really gung-ho on their call with in investors. They said, we, oh, well, CEO, interim CEO Howard Schultz noting, we are not currently seeing any measurable reduction in customer spending or any evidence of mm. customers trading down, of course, Cold sales there, 75% of beverages are cold. That's a big win for Starbucks. But more to come. Dutch Bros is reporting after the bell today. So we'll see how customers are responding there. Those cold brews and those blooming onions, not cheap for sure. Yeah, your finances <laughs> broke to Palma. Thanks so much. I do want to mention oh, yeah. eggs, though, because you know who's getting yeah. hurt by eggs? That is Dime Brands. They mm -hmm. are they own IHOP. They, church, they serve a lot of omelets. Dime Brands CEO uh, John Payton told me yesterday, commodities in the second quarter up over 20%. That is a big increase for a chain like that. But, Brian, I want to go back to a point that you made because we're seeing futures really rip higher here under this notion. Perhaps maybe the Fed pulls back on, on rate hikes. But, look, inflation up 8.5%. The Fed's target for inflation, what, 2%? Yes. They're still going to move forward on rate hikes. And, and that's the important thing to remember here, right? This is the first inflation report that we've gotten in a while mm -hmm. that shows a decline in the year-over-year -year gains that we're seeing. So we're talking about a rate of increase getting slower. This is not the same thing as prices falling. And not deflation. And not deflation, right? But again, 8.5%, that's a notch down. This is a great chart. It's a notch down from June. But we're still way far away from the 2% target that the Fed would like to see Price is increasing at. So it doesn't change the overall story, which is the Fed needs to continue to try to raise interest rates to lower the demand, to take some steam out of an economy that is partly contributing to the higher prices. But a tough challenge for the Fed when the other factors that are leading to these price increases for, let's say, for example, commodities is you know, the war in Ukraine, or for eggs, for example, weather-related things, or the bird flu. That was a big factor for, for chickens early on in the year. So those are things the Fed obviously can't control. But look, they have said they need to continue to raise interest rates. You have some Fed officials like Jim Bullard saying they got to get to 4%. That implies at least another, you know, 100-plus uh, basis points in terms of hikes throughout the rest of this year. That doesn't stop the story, but you're right. Maybe markets are taking a little bit of solace and saying, well, the Fed, especially after that hot labor market report we got last mm -hmm. Friday, doesn't have to go 75 or maybe even 100 basis points in the next meeting. But of course, there's going to be another CPI report and another jobs report before the next policy setting meeting in September.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live, everyone. Despite the latest jobs reports exceeding estimates, recession concerns they continue to swarm as Americans await a new inflation print this week for the month of July. Now, what could this all mean for the markets? For more on this, we've got Michael Antonelli, Baird Managing Director and Market Strategist. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Michael, in your bullish case, you believe inflation has peaked. Where has that started to show up to the extent that you've been tracking it thus far? Yeah, good morning, team. Great to see everybody uh, on this on this fine Monday. If you look at some of the things that have come down uh, noticeably, one of them would be commodity prices. I think that's uh, what most people would point to in terms of inflation potentially peaking. Oil prices can't hold a bid, really. Uh, you've seen it in the softs. You've seen it in some of the uh, you know some of the other commodities. So so you've already seen those come down. Uh, home prices have definitely started to ease. I mean, they may not be outright falling, but but shelter and home prices, their the pace of gains has certainly slowed down. Uh, and then auto prices, you start to see auto prices start to uh, start to stabilize a little bit in some of those uh, used car ind indices. So CPI obviously has taken on a Super Bowl level of importance this week. I mean, it's you're going to have to be uh, you know you're going to have to be talking about that nonstop on Wednesday. But uh, you have started to see some of the inputs come down. And and I think look at ISM uh, prices paid that suffered a huge drop. That that also could point towards. Uh, inflation potentially peaking here. Well, I'm feeling pretty good listening to you, Mike, uh, <laughs> citing all of this stuff. So how do you position then going into this print if it is a Super Bowl print? It's a great question. Positioning is everything, uh, as you know. It, you know, talking about economic data, talking about inflation, talking about all those kind of things is like, you know, talking about sports at a bar. It's like talking about the best football player or talking about who the best team is. Kind of a sports argument. Positioning is really all that matters. In fact, you should always be asking people, how are you positioned? I mean, that's really what I want to know because that's how you're actually uh, engaging in the market. Everybody's off sides. Can, can you guys point to anybody out there that's like banging the table being bullish? I mean, maybe Tom Lee, but that's, you know, uh, that that's definitely his deal. Uh, you know, everybody's off sides. You've even seen if S and P future uh, uh, open interest reports show uh, hedges kind of go up, Russell two thousand, same thing. Uh, so if positioning is really bearish, nobody's out there banging the table, and you get a soft print. And believe me, the bulls need a soft print. Uh, you could continue this rally a little bit higher. Yeah, Mike, I think Tom's looking for S&P 7000 at some point. But look, uh, you know, who is bullish increasingly on the Yahoo Finance platform? We're seeing investors showing more interest in Microsoft and Apple than perhaps had been the case uh, in prior months. Is it time for investors just to look beyond all the noise with the Federal Reserve and start to focus on high quality stocks like that? I actually looked before we just popped on here. I looked out to where Apple was down 8% year to date. I mean, would you believe that? Uh, given what we saw at the start of the year, you know, the, the fourth worst start to the year, Apple's down 8%, Microsoft, I think it was down about 17%. I do like to remind people, especially, uh, you know, platforms like these, or when I'm engaged with our clients that, you know, buying good companies and holding them through very difficult periods is is kind of, you know, the key to kind of growing wealth and, and reaching your goals. Uh, but yeah, you, you definitely want to be looking at what out there has gotten kind of thrown out of the bathwater. Are there companies out there that just sort of got caught up in this whirlwind who, whose earnings uh, expectations aren't that bad. You guys mentioned NVIDIA, clearly still struggling. Maybe it's a good time to build a build a gaming rig. Uh, clearly still struggling, but there are companies like Apple executing on their business plans really well. Uh, and remember, remember, the reason why these companies are so good is because they have suites of people every day trying to solve problems. And that doesn't change when inflation's high, when inflation's low, when Ukraine invades Russia, any of that, Russia invades Ukraine, any of that. So it, it's these people are trying to solve problems at all moments, and that's what makes them so great. And so for what we've seen in a lot of the earnings reports, companies either pulling or kind of suppressing some of the, the expectations for the future as well, have, have we hit kind of the bottom of that period? Have we, have we seen the last of that? Or do you expect more of that kind of going into future earnings periods as well, at least this year? Yeah, this is what's really important. I, I looked at it this morning, again, uh, right before I came on. If you were to go out to Q1 of 2023, all right, so that's three more quarters. There are no expectations for negative growth right now. Uh, they are expecting the growth rate of earnings to slow in the S&P 500, but there are no expectations for it to sink, for it to actually go mm -hmm. negative. There are companies pulling guidance. Obviously, it's a difficult time. Uh, and let me remind everybody that's watching this that the reason why it's a difficult time is because we just came out of a worldwide crisis. Like we do tend to forget that. Uh, there's a reason why the why the macro environment's so weird. But companies right now out to Q1 of 2023, in aggregate, we're not expected earnings to fall. Uh, that's really important. That's really, really important. Earnings continuing to grow is, is the bull case. Uh, everyone off sides is the bull case. Uh, there is a bear case, uh, but but right now earnings are still growing even at a slower rate. 
Michael Antonelli coming out on fire for us uh, to off kick off this trading week. Baron Managing Director and Market Strategist. Always good to see you. I'll talk to you on Twitter. Welcome to Yahoo Finance Presents. I'm Jennifer Schoenberger. Five former Treasury secretaries endorsing the slimmed down version of the Build Back Better bill now being dubbed the Inflation Reduction Act. Former Treasury Secretaries Geithner, Liu, Paulson, Rubin, and Summers all saying in a statement, quote, taxes due or paid will not increase for any family making less than $400,000 a year. And the extra taxes levied on corporations do not reflect increases in the corporate tax rate, but rather the reclaiming of revenue lost to tax avoidance and provisions benefiting the most affluent. Former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers joins me now to discuss this. Mr. Secretary, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for being here. So the Inflation Reduction Act would impose a 15% minimum corporate tax rate on companies earning a billion dollars or more in revenues. And you say, along with a handful of former Treasury secretaries, both Democratic and Republican, uh, in a statement today that the extra taxes levied on corporations do not reflect increases in the corporate tax rate, but rather the reclaiming of revenue loss to tax avoidance and provisions benefiting the most affluent. My question is, though, how do you see this impacting job creation and business investment at a time when the economy is slowing? I don't think the effects are likely to be harmful. I think that the total effects of this bill could very likely be positive. The stimulus to renewable uh, investment in particular that's given by the tax credit uh, provisions is likely to do far more to stimulate investment than closing various loopholes, which in some cases probably encourage financial manipulation rather than uh, real productive uh, investments. I don't think there's any reason at all to think that asking corporations to that report themselves as profitable every year to pay ta- pay something uh, in taxes at a minimum rate of fifteen uh, percent is likely uh, to be harmful, and in fact, by expanding the taxation of their global income relative to their domestic income, I actually think this could encourage jobs to be brought home. Republicans have argued that the bill would break President Biden's pledge to not raise taxes on those earning $400,000 or less uh, based on the Joint Committee on Taxation's analysis that uh, higher taxes paid by corporations would indirectly raise the effective tax burden on those with incomes of $200,000 or less. Your rebuttal to that? I don't think that's a credible argument. The uh... What the taxes are placed on uh, corporations, they're placed only on profitable uh, corporations. Disproportionately, they're going to fall on corporations who are making investments abroad. That's going to work out on balance uh, favorably for uh, the whole economy. There's no sense in which this is a tax placed on. any family with income below $400,000. Sir, this bill is titled the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, And while it does lower the deficit, some analysis out this week from Wharton finds virtually no impact on inflation, uh, noting the estimates are, quote, statistically indistinguishable from zero. Uh, Your reaction to that, and what is your argument for this bill decreasing inflation? Do you see that happening? So the Wharton analysis takes no account of lower prescription drug prices. The Wharton analysis takes no account of increased uh, energy supply. The Wharton analysis is extremely conservative in its assumptions about extra government revenue from uh, better tax enforcement. And still the Wharton uh, analysis acknowledges that this legislation is doing great things for the environment, great things for health access, great things for fairness without contributing to inflation. 
if Wharton, which focuses on the fiscal policy analysis, but doesn't focus on the sectoral uh, analysis, had recognized the impact on pharmaceuticals, for example, then it would have reached the same conclusion that bipartisan treasury secretaries reached, that this is reducing inflation. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you said that uh, you think that the impact of this bill will be additive, uh, will help investment, will help the economy. Um, I'm curious, uh, your outlook for inflation from here, uh, the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates by 75 basis points for the past two meetings. Uh, we're still seeing high readings on CPI on the Fed's preferred inflation gauge of PCE. Uh, granted, uh, there's a bit of a lag indicator there. Um, we have seen commodity prices coming down. Uh, what is your outlook for inflation from here and how does this bill tie in with that? Jennifer, I think we've got real inflation problems in the country. I don't think they're going to go away uh, quickly. I think they're a consequence of the overheating of the economy that took place last year, along with uh, adverse supply shocks. And that's just something we're going to have to work through and live with. I think we will do so in a better way if this bill passes. But this bill is certainly not sufficient to contain our inflation problem. And even with this bill, we're going to have inflation problems for quite some time to come. The important thing though, is that this is doing a whole set of necessary things for our country while beginning the process of reducing uh, inflation pressure. You just said you think inflation is gonna be with us for a long time to come. Uh, and as just noted, the Fed has been pretty aggressive do you think they should sustain that aggressive stance? Fed Chair Powell said at his press conference that uh, there's a prospect of perhaps tailoring the size of those rate hikes or minimizing, I should say, the size of those rate hikes uh, from 75 maybe to 50 basis points in there, 25 basis points. Do you think the Fed needs to be more aggressive as we go through the latter half of this year? We'll have to see how the data unfold. And I'm not prepared to make a prescription for the September Fed meeting at uh, this point. I do think there's an important lesson that we all learn at some point in our lives, which is when the doctor prescribes a set of antibiotics, you have to take the whole course through and you're making a mistake and you're compromising your potential health if you stop taking the antibiotics the moment you feel better. And I think there's some similar principle here with respect to the central bank, that if inflation comes down a bit, if the economy looks like it's uh, slowing, it will be tempting to stop raising interest rates. And indeed, people in the market are expecting that interest rates will come down beginning in December or January. And I think that would be a serious error. Interesting, okay. Um, before we get to your outlook on the economy, I, I do wanna ask you, uh, while the Fed is in the driver's seat for trying to reduce inflation, you know, what other actions do you think the administration could take at this point? For instance, uh, should the president um, dial back pres former President Trump's uh, tariffs on Chinese imports? Um, are there other actions the administration could take to help ease inflation, perhaps when it comes to commodity prices, creating incentives for farmers, opening up more land, or perhaps that's just an issue that has to do with the weather? Your take. I think we should be reducing tariffs, not just on Chinese goods, but on goods uh, all over. I think the consumer interest is really important. I think we need to think more about affordability economics than we tend to, than we tend to do. And we need to put consumers first uh, many times. I think there are things we can do uh, in this bill and outside of this bill that would reduce energy uh, regulation and make possible more production and even more, more distribution of energy, which would contribute to lower gasoline prices and lower energy prices. I think in general, if we can have more rapid permitting um, and less NIMBY problems, less not in my backyard regulation, I think we could get more housing built and that would contribute to more affordable uh, housing. So in general, I think we 
need to think about uh, affordability, whether the issue is higher education, whether the issue is uh, health care, and that could make a contribution to reducing inflation, though I think the overwhelmingly most important determinant of inflation is going to be the cyclical performance of the economy and what monetary policies we pursue. You said just a bit ago that it would be a serious mistake uh, for the Fed to sort of do a U-turn uh, after hiking rates um, next year as the market is pricing in. Uh, given that, I'm curious, do you think that a soft landing can be engineered here? We just saw two consecutive uh, quarters of negative GDP growth, uh, what some would call a common definition for a recession. Of course, the official arbiter looks at much more than that. And Secretary Yellen has argued we'd need to see massive layoffs to actually be in a recession right now. Uh, do you think a soft landing is in the cards? Uh, or do you think that a recession is near or that we are in one, given what we've seen with the GDP numbers? I don't think we're in a recession. I think it's unlikely that it will be judged that in July of uh, 2022, the American economy was in recession. I think given the difficulties associated with high inflation and bringing it down, the necessary monetary policy response, the odds that the economy will go into recession within the next 18 months are quite serious and probably in the three quarters range. And I think that if the economy gets into a situation where unemployment rises, unemployment is likely to rise quite substantially. And so I would expect sometime within the next two or three years that the unemployment rate would cross 6%. And then that would that be the medicine that's really needed to get inflation back under control? Is recession I think needed, we're essentially? I think we're unlikely, as I've said many, many times, I think we are unlikely to restore inflation to target levels in scenarios that don't involve a recession at some point. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for your insight. I so appreciate it. Hope to speak with you again soon. Thank you. For more on the markets, let's bring in Brent Schutte, Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management Company, Chief Investment Officer. Good to see you, sir. I want to start where Brian left off there with that precipitous drop there in WTI. What do you make of it? Is it really factoring in and showing those recessionary fears? I think so. But in general, I mean, Americans have driven less this summer than they have in past. And so gasoline demand has been lower, which has caused uh, those prices to come down. And that's the real reason behind it. And so I don't know if that's economic recessions or just people changing their lives and not going out as much as they used to, because a lot of us are still working at home. Uh, and so in general, I, I think that's behind it. And that has going to have a good impact on inflation moving forward. Hey, Brett, Brian Chung here. So on the point of just kind of the broad market action that we've seen lately, we do know that the big story is the Federal Reserve. So when you take a look at commodities prices, does anything that you're seeing with the decline in gas prices actually tell you that, hey, all the volatility we've gotten in 2022 so far might be the worst and already behind us, given how energy prices could be helpful to the inflation story? I think so. I think the market is sniffing out that forward indicators of inflation, like oil, like commodities, like container ships, like other things that are happening, are showing that inflation is going to moderate. And that means the Federal Reserve is likely to follow through with what they've said they're going to do, but they probably won't have to do much more than that. And that's been the big fear. The big fear has been that the economy would slow, but inflation wouldn't go with it. And what you're seeing is, yes, the economy is slowing. We may have a mild recession, but inflation has been highly sensitive to that, and it's going to be coming down, which will uh, alleviate some of those fears and possibly lead to a market that grinds higher as we push into 2023. Just to clarify, are we talking about another 75 point hike or are you in the 50 range? And when do you think we will see a positive print on inflation? Will we see it next month given the fall of gas prices? Yeah, I mean, the, the expectations on Wall Street for the CPI print next week is 0.2% month over month, which would be a positive surprise uh, lower from what we've been in the past. And so I think you're gonna see more of those in the future. Uh, and as I mentioned, all those indicators are showing that inflation is set to come down. I think the Fed does 75 basis points uh, keep in mind, this is supposedly a Fed that doesn't offer forward guidance, but I still hear them on TV every day talking about what they're going to do. Um, look, the Fed wants to maintain their inflation credibility. 
inflation fighting credibility, I should say. They want to talk tough. They have to talk tough because the reason they had to go uh, harder uh, was because the market was starting to think inflation was more permanent. They wanted to tamp down inflation expectations, and they've done a good job of that. And so I think we get 75 this time, possibly 25 one more time. And then I do think you might be done if the data continues to be in the same direction that it is today. <laughs> well, Brent, on your point about Fed speak, I was actually uh, speaking with the Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester on the phone earlier this afternoon, asking her just kind of about where you could see the Fed stopping. Her suggestion that they could go past 4 4%. Having said all of that, we've heard what the Fed speakers have said. There's going to be more interest rate hikes. Why haven't you seen financial conditions tighten more? Why is the 10-year yield falling? Why is the 30-year mortgage rate falling? Isn't that counterintuitive to what the Fed wants to do here in dampening demand? Yeah, I mean, demand has already dampened. We've had two negative quarters of GDP. You've seen the housing market off 24%. I mean, the Fed rate hikes have already had a dramatic impact that is just beginning to filter through the economy. And so the housing market is off 24% from its highs. You are going to see prices decline there, or at least moderate, which will have a dampening effect on inflation. Keep in mind that the market probably doesn't agree with Loretta Mester. We'll see. The Fed is data dependent. They're month to month, even though they are offering forward guidance. Uh, they want to talk tough right now because they want to keep inflation fighting credibility there. But they have shown that they can pivot fairly quickly. As a reminder, a few months ago, they went from saying they were going to do 50 to 75 um, uh, within, you know, right before the meeting. And so I, I do think there are certainly doubts out there. There's certainly risk out there. Um, but a lot of the things that we've talked about why inflation should show uh, should slow in the future are starting to show they're going to slow. And we'll get a key input tomorrow with the jobs report. What happens to wages? Yeah, that will be a key report. We're looking right now at Treasury yields. What is the 10 year telling you is coming? I think it's telling you that there is a recession likely coming. I think it, the market is telling you on the equity side that it's likely to be mild. Uh, and that's where I think the market is OK. I mean, you've seen economic growth slow over the past few weeks. At the same time, the market has rallied. And this is because inflation has been coming with it. And this is because the market believes uh, the, the dire circumstance would be that we slip into a recession, but because inflation hasn't fallen, the Fed has to keep going. I think you're starting to see that become priced out of the market, which is why the market is actually rising. The 10 years telling you likely there is going to be a recession. Uh, the curve is certainly inverted. Uh, that's telling you recession. But I think the market believes, much like I do, that any recession would be mild just given the overall state of the U.S. consumer, which even despite the recent price hikes and oil price increases is still in pretty decent shape in aggregate. Uh, Brent, what's the move right now? Because you've seen some people already call a bottom. Maybe you want to get in while you still can. Is it small caps that you're looking at right now? I mean, Russell 2000 is still underperforming the broad S&P. Yeah, and so when I say small caps, we look at the S&P 600, which is a higher quality index, which actually I believe is the part of the market in the U.S. that's up the most this year, or down the least, I should say. Not up the most, that's wishful thinking. Um, but that's the area that we like. I mean, it trades at 13 times 2022 earnings. Certainly some of those earnings could be at risk, but this quarter they were very strong and the expectations did not come down much. That gives you a margin of safety against falling earnings expectations. Now, if the recession is deeper than what I think, the area could be a, a bit of uh, in harm. But keep in mind, I mentioned a margin of safety. It typically trades somewhere 18 plus uh, times earnings, at least for the past 25 years. Uh, and so there is room against a downturn and if the recession is mild, this is an economically sensitive area that will do well on the opposite side also. And so that's the area that we've been focused on in our portfolios. All right, Brent Schutte over at Northwestern. Thanks so much for taking the time to stop by this afternoon. Appreciate it. In this episode of Influencers, Allianz Chief Economic Advisor, Mohammed El Arian. So it is bad analysis, bad forecast, too little, too late, and miscommunication. And that's how we've ended up in this mess. We need to get back to a world where the Federal Reserve is credible because that is absolutely essential to the well-being of our society. We simply are not in a recession. Is the recession, risk of recession high? Yes, it is high and getting higher. And welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. And welcome to our guest, Mohammed El Arian, president of Queens College at the University of Cambridge and chief economic advisor at Allianz. Mohammed, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for having me on your show. So you said uh, at one point uh, recently, I think, that you thought inflation had peaked. How did you arrive at that conclusion? Can you elaborate? Yes, the old-fashioned way. So I look at the components of headline inflation, 
and in particular what's been driving it higher in, in recent times. And what we have right now is energy and food in particular are going to be much weaker drivers of inflation. So the headline number is going to come down, but worrisomely, the core number is going to stay stubbornly high. And that just speaks to an inflation process that has become more entrenched and, and has become more broad-based in, in our economy. Right, transitory, entrenched, broad-based. So, so what is your prognosis when it comes to inflation in terms of sustainability and um, severity? It will come down by the end of the year. It will be sticky. I'm looking for a core CPI in the four and a half to five and a half percent range. So well above the 2% target of the Fed. But what I'm most worried about, Andy, is the collateral damage that's going to be associated with inflation coming down because the Fed has been so late in responding. Yeah, I mean, you've been critical of the Fed uh, in, in a high profile way. Um, and, and so what, what do you think of their moves to uh, raise rates and combat inflation? I mean, how did they get it wrong? Why did they get it wrong? How wrong has it been? So they started getting it wrong 15 months ago when they absolutely embraced the notion of transitory when it was an open question. Had they listened to companies, they would have been much more humble in saying we don't quite understand the inflation dynamics because companies themselves were warning that the supply disruptions they were seeing, and we know the list, supply chains, container ships, what, they were, what companies were seeing, what they were warning, saying we're not sure they're going to resolve themselves quickly, and yet the Fed got hooked on this notion it's transitory. And then it got itself into a cognitive trap. It kept on repeating it and repeating it and repeating it all the way, as you know, till the very last day of November, by which time it was clear that inflation was a problem. And then we tied it, but didn't move. It could have done more at that stage. And you ended up with this absurd situation that in March, it was still pumping in liquidity. It was still doing QE in March when the inflation rate measuring for February with a month lag was already at, at a 7% handle. So it is bad analysis, bad forecast, too little, too late, and miscommunication. And that's how we've ended up in this mess. A cognitive trap sounds like something we all should be avoiding, Mohammed. Um, so the causes of inflation, obviously COVID leading to supply chain issues. Then we have Russia. Those may be transitory, or we certainly hope they are. What about globalization and nationalization, deglobalization? Is that a bigger factor and a more worrisome one even, perhaps? So what you point to is, is really important. So we have two big dynamics going on. One is on the demand supply. We've gone from a world of deficient aggregate demand to a world of deficient aggregate supply. Um, and you spoke about the elements of that. That's going to resolve itself. But we have another phenomenon going on, which is the nature of globalization is changing. And we are going from a very intense focus on efficiency on just in time to another focus on resilience just in case. And that transition is by its nation, by its nature, inflationary. And that hasn't played out fully yet. Um, that's why it was really important and it remains really important to ensure that the inflation dynamics don't develop very deep roots across many, many segments of our, of our economy. Otherwise, we may end up with a low growth, high inflation environment for much longer than we need to. Could it ultimately be a good thing, Mohammed, that we are reshoring a lot of our supply chain in the United States and wouldn't technology then mitigate costs over a period of time and that would um, perhaps offset inflationary pressures and create jobs in the United States, maybe a win-win? So I think that's the most likely long-term journey. The problem that we face is that, the, sorry, so most long-term destination, 
The problem we face is that the journey to that destination is so tricky that we may end up at another destination. So yes, it is a good thing if we get there, but you don't get there without a lot more policy focus, a lot more private public partnership, and a lot more communication than we've had so far. What do you think about central banks generally, Mohammed? I mean, there's some people who are critical of the Fed, and it's like you, you talk to them for five minutes, and it turns out there are these people who hate all central bankers. I don't, I don't think you're quite in that camp, but is there a cult of central banking? So first of all, I'm not at all in that camp. I think central banks play a very important role. The reason why I'm so critical is because central banks have an enormous responsibility, and they're given enormous power. Where else do you have an institution that is so powerful and can make decisions on its own, has political autonomy. And that is an incredible thing to have. And that comes with a lot of responsibility. So, so you have to be held accountable to your actions. And I think central banks are absolutely key and politically independent central banks are essential for economic well-being. So I am not in the camp of central banks are uh, something we shouldn't have and anything else. No, we absolutely need them but we need them to function well. And we need them to be honest. When they make a mistake, tell us why you've made a mistake and tell us what you've done in order not to repeat the mistake. You know, it, it dismays me, Andy, that when the Fed publishes its quarterly projections, people call it laughable. And who calls it laughable? Former, former Fed officials. They, they also complain. And, and we need to get back to a world where the Federal Reserve is credible, because that is absolutely essential to the well-being of our society. I also want to ask you about GDP and using it as a measuring tool, as a be-all to end-all, to measure nations' economies, and even actually to measure their societies. I mean, there's been some talk lately about how that's not maybe the best way to measure an economy. What do you think about GDP? So it is a shortcut, but it's not comprehensive enough. Um, the problem is that, talk about cognitive trap, we've all gotten used to measuring things by GDP, and we're having a huge problem getting out of that. Um, also, the nature of your GDP growth is important. Is it inclusive? Is it non-inclusive? Um, that's really important. So look, it, it is a useful measure, but it is just a tiny, um, perspective into an economy. We've been talking a lot about inflation, but what about the R word, recession? Do you think we're headed for a recession? If so, how severe will it be? What do you see in those tea leaves, Mohammed? So my definition of a recession is, is a holistic definition. It goes well beyond two quarters of negative GDP. Um, we are not yet into a in a recession. We're not. Um, the, labor, the labor market is too strong, consumer spending is too strong, business um, balance sheets are too strong. We, we simply are not in a recession. Is the recession, risk of recession high? Yes, it is high and getting higher. Why? One, the Fed is hiking into a slowing economy. Two, as the IMF uh, forecast showed us recently, all the major areas of the global economy are slowing. You know, they're called the gloomy and uncertain. These are strong words coming from the IMF. I was there for 15 years. I know you don't use the word gloomy lightly. Um, so we, we do have a high risk of recession. It's not preordained that there, there are and should be me um, various measures to be taken in four areas in particular to stop us from slipping into recession. Um, but let's, let's monitor it. The risk is certainly high, Andy. What are those four areas? So first and foremost, we've got to get control of the inflation beast. And that is a Fed that needs to act in not only tightening its monetary policy, but also regaining credibility. Its forward guidance right now is almost meaningless. And that, that's not a good thing. It's a major tool of monetary policy. So, so the Fed has a lot to do on the inflation front. Second, we need to target fiscal policy more to protect the most vulnerable segments of our society. That has massive economic, social, and political consequences. Third, there's a whole host of pro-growth, pro-productivity reforms that need to be done 
including to increase labor force participation, to improve what you talked about, the supply chains. They have a domestic angle and they have an international angle. And then finally, let's not forget financial stability. Let's not forget how risk has not only morphed and migrated from banks to non-banks, but non-banks have been encouraged by years of zero interest rates and massive and predictable liquidity injections to go well beyond their native habitat in taking risk. So the non-banking sector is still offside, and we have to keep an eye on the financial stability risk because that could get back, come back and harm the economy. I want to drill down on number three because we focus so much, or we tend to, both people in my business and people in your business, on monetary policy. But are there physical policy tools coming from, say, the White House that can be utilized to combat inflation and to fight recessions? And what are they? Yes, absolutely. Um, they don't have an immediate effect, um, but they are important. They basically come down to facilitating the supply side. You remember I mentioned that we've gone from a world of deficient aggregate demand to deficient aggregate supply. And we see it everywhere. Um, you need only go out um, and you'll see what labor shortages look like. You'll see what supply chain disruptions look like. Um, on the labor side, it is critical that we take steps to enhance labor force participation. Um, that comes down to basic issues like childcare, that's really important. We, female labor force participation hasn't recovered to the levels where, where it should be. We can do more on supply chains. There is a massive set of opportunities for public-private partnerships. We should learn from the good things that happened during the pandemic in terms of how private-public partnerships can work really well. And then finally, let's not forget that that's an international problem. It's not a, just a national. So it collective action becomes really important. I think that these areas, unfortunately, are underemphasized by your profession and by mine, because we tend to focus on the urgent and immediate, which is inflation, and then the recession risk that comes from having let inflation out of the bottle. Yeah, I've been focused on this point, Mohammed, of, of too much um, looking at these shortcut things, which are GDP, cutting interest rates, you know, it's just, but they're, they're deeper problems and deeper solutions, perhaps. Interesting stuff there. In a recent piece, you outlined three upsides of the current economic uh, conundrum that we're in. It, it is fascinating. What are they? And are those silver linings or what? So there were ups of the market situation. You know, if, if you were an investor and you, you, you looked at what happened in the first half of the year, what happened to your retirement, what happened to your investments, it's a pretty depressing picture. Not only have you lost a significant amount of money on your equities, but your bonds that are supposed to be your risk mitigators, they also got hit really hard. So you've had massive problems of returns, significantly negative. Your correlations, your risk mitigation did not work at all. And it's been a pretty volatile. So it's understandable that when people looked at their first half um, statements, they got quite upset. Having said that, if you look forward, there are some silver linings. I don't want to in any way understate the losses because they are painful, but the silver linings. One is because valuations are becoming more reasonable, we're starting to see entry points for really attractive long-term investment. They are selective. They are individual rather than general. So they're not buying the index, but they're buying certain names that have been contaminated much more than they should given their fundamentals. So there's value being created. We also finally are seeing bonds return to their traditional role of risk mitigation. Why? Because interest rate risk, inflation risk has played out, and now we're looking at recession risk. So that, that's really important. And then third, something that people don't think about, we came this close to having a third risk factor. And as you can see, I really like thinking in terms of risk factor rather than asset classes. A third risk factor come together with the other two, which is inflation risk and recession risk. And that is market functioning risk. There were periods uh, where we saw liquidity really strained and 
the good news is the markets held and we were able to navigate through the repositioning that people wanted to do. Yeah, I gather you're talking about, say, March of 2020, one of those little scary points. Um, Want to ask you about um, just sort of continuing this market conversation part about the big tech stocks and FANG and all that. You're out in California. You have some exposure uh, to that community as well. What is your thinking on the prospects for those companies? We're in the midst of earnings seasons for them as well. We are. And I think the on the whole, the the earning messages are things are not as bad as me as people were afraid of. And that's the good news. But what you're seeing is significant differentiation compared a snap to an alphabet. Um, so we're seeing and then we're seeing dispersion happen. If, if you like, think in terms of a distribution. Big, big tech is going to do fine. And then venture opportunities remain exciting. It is the middle of the distribution where you don't have scale, um, where things are getting more difficult. Um, and that's why SNAP is in, is in that direction. So this is a very um, barbelled situation, and it's going to remain so for the next few months. Right. So in other words, the venture, you are excited by the prospect of a hockey stick growth chart. And then on the other side, you've got these big, stable legacy um, businesses. But in the middle where uh, growth has peaked, perhaps, market not so happy about that, right? Right. And, and, and they find it much harder to compete with the giants um, because they don't have the diversified sources of income that the giants have. Um, so they have less resilience, which in, which in turn reduces their agility. And you need that agility um, when you're in that, in, at, at that growth path. Right. Shifting gears in another recent piece, Mohammed, you mentioned the implementation of the debt service suspension initiative and the formulation of the common framework for debt treatment by the G20, which is a form of assistance to emerging countries to emerging countries during COVID. Were these mistakes? Why or, or weren't they? So they were good intentions. Now we go, we're going back to 2020, um, first, second quarter, when we've realized that this shock was a significant exogenous shock, where poor, the poor countries in particular would need to liberate financing for COVID relief. And the official sector came in with these two initiatives that you mentioned the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, DSSI, which basically said, you don't need to pay us. We are going to postpone your payments. And then the other one was the common framework, which was meant to bring different creditors together in order to provide relief to um, developing countries. It was a good initiative. It was well-intentioned. The implementation was disappointing. Um, and disappointing in two regards. One is you didn't get private sector participation. The private sector ended up being a free rider on this because there was no mechanism to get the private sector involved. Um, so the private sector continued being paid while the public sector carried the burden once again. And that's not a repeated game, Andy. At some point, the public sector says no more. Um, we need fair burden sharing. And then if you don't get fair burden sharing in an orderly fashion, you end up having fair burden sharing in a disorderly fashion where everybody loses out. The second issue that was disappointing is that it simply suspended the payments, but didn't restructure them in any fundamental way. So now if you look at the profile of debt servicing, there's a big bulge coming um, in a year and a half's time, which is somehow going to have to be navigated. So good, well, good intention, it was the absolutely right approach, but unfortunately implementation fell short of expectations. Another uh, area where you've weighed in uh, is Russia. And recently you've recommended we continue our sanctions against Russia. In particular, you've said that we should end exceptions for its energy sector. Why is that? We're in the muddled middle right now. Um, we, we have imposed sanctions on Russia for good reason. We have undermined its economy, but we've carved out the most important sector for Russia, which is energy, and allowed that to be treated relatively favorable. 
So the outcome of that is that Russia declares that sanctions haven't hurt it much. And we are disappointed that we haven't been able to encourage China to change, encourage Russia to change its behavior. Um, and the reason why is because of these carve outs. So we can continue in this, in this muddled middle or we, 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 we should bite the bullet and end these carve outs because we've done something else, Andy, that you and I will be talking about in the next few years. We've monetized, we've, we've weaponized, we've weaponized the international payment system. Mm -hmm. And we've weaponized the international payment system without any set of standards, safeguards or anything else. And if you are in a third country looking at that, you're gonna start asking yourself question as to your vulnerability to a dollar-based system. And if we're not careful, we end up fragmenting the global economy. Can you explain what weaponizing uh, the monetary system means exactly? Yeah, you know, Russia is a G20 member. Russia is the 11th largest economy, or was the 11th largest economy in the world on the eve of its uh, illegal invasion of Ukraine. And the notion that you would put sanctions on its central bank, the notion that you would take it out of the payment system and wouldn't allow it to settle through the payment system was one that was almost unthinkable. That is the nuclear weapon of sanctions. Um, trade sanctions, sanctions on individuals, this is something we know. And you know what? There, there, there is a system that governs the, tra the trading sanctions, et cetera. But this was something really different. Um, it's very powerful if you don't have carve outs. You can bring an economy to its knees. I mean, imagine that I suddenly stop you from using any credit card, debit card you have, and all you have is a bit of cash, and I tell people you can't accept Andy's cash anymore. No matter what you want to do in terms of paying or receiving, you won't be able to do it. That's how powerful sanctions of the payment system is. So, so we've weaponized a really powerful tool without having the safeguards that come with weaponizing a really powerful tool. The other big actor in this equilibrium or disequilibrium is China. And I wonder how concerned you are right now about the US-China relationship. So it is not getting any better. Um, it is, if, if anything, it is getting worse. It is particularly concerning for countries that I call having the dual option model. I mean, think of Australia. For a very long time, Australia looked to China for its economic prosperity. That's where most of its exports went. That's where economic activity was expanding really rapidly. And looked at the US for national security. It was part of the Five I, the intelligence system. And that dual option model had a very low price. As tensions between China and the US started to increase, that model became less sustainable. And as you know, Australia ultimately was forced to make a choice and it opted for US national security. And as a result, its economic relationship with, with China has been significantly damaged. So these, this tension between the US and China has implications that go well beyond the US and China um, and has also implications for the functioning of the international monetary system. I know you've talked about climate change as well um, in the past. Does that kind of take a back seat with all these other problems going on? And is that an unfortunate consequence of, say, tensions with Russia and what Europe's going through? It's a disaster consequence. And when, when, when we think of what we're going to leave our kids, we need to take the threat and the reality of climate change much more seriously. And the responses, the short-term responses, you were talking earlier about the immediate versus the long-term, the short-term responses to the implications of the Ukraine war has been to go backwards. Um, coal mines are being opened again. Some governments are subsidizing the use of fossil fuel um, in order to alleviate the cost of living crisis. There's other ways they could have done it. It's, it's unfortunate that they chose that measure. So it is a concern that we are going backwards on something that already we're behind on. 
and that is the fight against climate change. We seem to be in a bit of a crypto winter, Mohammed, and uh, I'm wondering just how cold is it and how long will this chill continue? I don't mean to be flipped. I, how, how serious is this and what's your take on crypto these days? So any innovation that I know of, any major innovation that I know of goes through winters, okay? And it's really important to understand the steam engine went through winters, the fiber optics went through winters, securitization famously went through more than a winter. I don't know what you call that. Um, and there's a reason for that, which is human behavior. If I suddenly lower the barriers to entry to an activity and do it suddenly, um, you get typically overproduction and overconsumption. That's what we do when we suddenly allowed to do something that we couldn't do before, we hadn't thought of before, we overreact. So it is not surprising to me that innovations are never linear. They go through, May, through winters. Um, this, depending on how you measure it, is either the second or the third winter for crypto. What it's doing is it's, it's shaking the system, it's cleansing it of its excesses. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer that crypto is here to stay. I do not believe that we're going to have Bitcoin as the reserve currency of the world, but neither do I believe that the whole crypto is one big joke um, that has suckered a lot of people into it. I think crypto has significant innovation that we're going to see play out in fintech. We're going to see play out in other areas. And what you're getting is a bit of a flushing out of the system. Um, and I think if you are a long-term player in that space, particularly in the application of the innovations that come with crypto, that at the end of the day is gonna end up being a good thing for you. Mohammed, you've lived all over the world. Now you're bouncing back and forth between the UK and the United States. What is the UK versus the United States like now? How has that changed? Maybe they used to be at parity in some regards. Are things different? not part of uh, the EU anymore. What's it like? So, so I think the US is much more resilient than the UK. Um, just look at, at, at what's happening right now. Yes, the US is having difficulty with inflation at 9% with growth slowing, but in the UK, it's called the cost of living crisis. And that cost of living crisis is giving rise to industrial action, there are strikes, People feel that it is the summit of discontent. So the systems are different in terms of their ability to absorb shocks. And then the second issue is, is, is what you just said. The UK is still redefining its relationship with the rest of the world. It had exited one regime, one paradigm, the EU, but it hasn't reestablished an equilibrium yet in a new paradigm, whereas the US is pretty stable in, in its paradigms with the exception of China. Um, so it, it, it's an issue of resilience and stability. Um, that's what the big difference is right now. Mohammed, this show is called Influencers and you, are, you certainly are one. And I'm curious as to how you see using your influence on the world. So what I try to do, Andy, is through my writings, through discussions like that with you, um, through social media, is share with people things that I find interesting, thought-provoking, and hypotheses. I don't try to tell you what to conclude, Andy. I try to, to say, here are the certain things that you should think about. And there are a few things, there have been five so far, as far as I know, when I feel really strongly and only one in which I use capital letters throughout, um, where I, I, I will try and, and not only inform your thinking, but go well beyond and try to strongly influence it. But my role is to try and inform people um, so that they make better decisions. And what I appreciate most is when people come back to me and say, you're wrong, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Quickly, what were some of those five things, and in particular, the all caps one? So February 2020, in the beginning, was an all cap world when saying, when I said this, what is happening in China, increasingly happening in Italy, take it seriously. This is not a thing that will stay there. COVID will not stay there. Coronavirus, as we called it then, will not stay there. Um, 
the global financial crisis. Um, inflation, you know, I wrote a book, as you know, in 2016, The Only Game in Town, that looked at what would happen if we continued to rely on central banks and central banks were forced to stay out of their well-defined area of operation for such a long time. So it's that sort of thing. And of course, it was Argentina's default, which I couldn't understand in 1999 and 2000, why people were continuing to allocate so much money um, to a default that I thought was, was almost preordained because of um, past policy failures. Got it. Last quick question. You know I have to ask you. You are a big New York Jets fan. So I have to ask you, what are the, their prospects for the coming season? And second part, in the UK, which EPL team do the Jets remind you of? Okay, so um, the process for the Jets, I'm going to go through the same cycle, and you know it well, where yeah. I'm hoping that we can have a winning season. And within the first two games, first against the Ravens, uh, we're going to come to the reality that this is going to be another losing season, and let's just hope we can beat the Patriots. Um, in terms of, look, it's really funny, because if you look at the teams I support, they had one or two big days, and that's it. The Jets, they haven't won anything since 1969. The Mets, they haven't won anything in 19, since 1986. And then if you go to British football, English football, I support a team that's not even in the top division anymore that has fallen. It's called Queen's Park Rangers, QPR. Um, so I, I somehow have two traits. I pick losers, and I'm incredibly loyal to them. You like the underdogs, and you're loyal. Or... I turn winners into losers, and I'm loyal. <laughs> All right, you're being too harsh on yourself. Mohamed El Arian, president of Queens College at Cambridge, chief economic advisor at Allianz. Thank you so much for your time, Mohamed. Thank you, Andy. It's a pleasure. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time. All right, well, another huge factor playing a role in these supply issues is inflation. With rising prices, customers are less willing to buy certain goods and are going for less expensive options. So consumer good companies like Unilever, Procter & Gamble are putting products in different packaging sizes, also bundling certain items together in an effort to lower prices. And Rochelle, we've talked about this time and time again as inflation keeps steadily creeping higher, people aren't necessarily getting paid more. We've seen the wage increases uh, severely lagging what we've seen in inflation. These consumer staples goods are, and companies are trying to do whatever they can to be more appealing to consumers because up until now, we've seen consumers willing to pay a little bit more. I think the narrative that we're hearing more and more often on these most recent earnings reports, the calls that we've been getting over the last couple of weeks, our executives are getting a little bit concerned just in terms of the likelihood that consumers will start to pull back on some of their purchases. And as obviously people try and make some of these decisions, that also affects things like brand loyalty. Like, why would you be paying more when things are tight? And that's helping some of these grocery stores and some of these store brands benefit from that. But it's obviously at the cost of some of these bigger, more expensive brands. Because look, things are tight right now. People are trying to make some decisions. And if you have to pinch somewhere, things you can't give up, things like food, you're going to have to find cheaper options. And we're seeing people turning to discount and dollar stores for their groceries as well. We're also seeing longer lines at food banks. So this is something that should be concerning companies. Obviously, some people still able to afford some of these things. But when you look at what's happening with food prices, as we're seeing on the screen, they're up 1% for food, up, and that's up more than 12% over the past year. And then if you look at things you have to spend for gasoline, even though gas prices still going down, but obviously still much higher than they were a year ago, it's just making people that much tighter with their discretionary spending. And ultimately, retailers have to get creative, and that's what they're doing. Unilever making products specifically for Costco, making products specifically for Walmart, focusing on the ounces and the, the deals people can get, bundling things together like deodorant. I'm the first guy in line to reach for the bundle for some reason over the single pack because just save, you know, 15, 20 cents per, and that's what we're doing right now. You're seeing Kraft Heinz launch 
$1 Lunchables, mm -hmm. which is again, a major in inflation adjustment for that company. 10 packs of macaroni and cheese, again, bundling things together, that Costco effect. You know, I like a little bit of alcohol. I did like Just a little. that Diageo said they are seeing <laughs> nothing from the consumer trading down on their brands, which really shows an interesting loyalty in that hard liquor industry to sticking with your brand, even it's costing you an extra few bucks. Yeah, and it's interesting. And going back to the last recession, 2007, 2008, we did see some of those liquor brands get hit initially, but they rebounded very, very quickly. And when people were willing to spend again, they didn't want to trade down on their alcohol. So I guess it's a Do bit of a Do you trade news. down on your booze? No, I don't. But I also am not that fancy to begin with. So I, I, I agree with you. Yeah. I'm very committed to my few <laughs> brands and not it's that pretty, expensive yeah. either. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's not that bad on my wallet. All right. Many Americans are struggling to make ends meet as surging inflation has energy prices up about 42 percent and food prices up more than 12 percent versus last year. People are increasingly turning to dollar and discount stores for their groceries. Now, according to a recent report by the Lending Club, roughly 157 million Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. It seems like there's no sight yet of prices easing fast enough to really meet the demand that people have. Shona, what's your take on this? I mean, Rochelle, it's something we talk about time and time again. More and more people are struggling to make ends meet. When you take that look at the latest CPI report, you see it in just the food prices. Bread up just about 11%, Dave. Meat up 8%. Beef and veal up 4%. Poultry up 17% clearly far outpacing the, the gains that we've seen in wages. People are finding it harder and harder to go to the grocery store and stay within their budget, and it's affecting their everyday life, obviously. Yeah, everybody you know has to cut back in some way. It is interesting, though, when you look at some of the earnings and you've heard yeah. some comments like, unrestrained consumer spending from companies like Visa. So there seems to be a strange dynamic where people are cutting back in spending, but then you have a lot of consumer facing companies in their earnings reports saying they see no pullback whatsoever in certain types of spending. It is a positive investor story, if you will, though. Costco's up 27% over the last 12 months. Yeah. Dollar General is up. Dollar Tree is up 70% thus far year to date. So it has been a positive story if you are an investor in dollar stores or in Costco or other discount chains as well. Yeah, and I wonder whether or not we've reached this point, right? So the consumers have been willing to spend more and more, but maybe now are we edging up against that level where we're starting to see an inflection point. Maybe people will start pulling back in the current quarter, Rochelle. Many companies are saying they aren't seeing it yet. It's hard to keep buying it though at this point. And one of the things we have to watch is a lot of the, the gains that these companies are seeing are from the higher prices, not necessarily people buying a, more, a larger volume of, fo of food products. And we're seeing actually a large increase in terms of food banks struggling, obviously their food subsidized, but they're still seeing that biting into the food that they're able to give people who are struggling. So perhaps at, at the bottom end, people who aren't earning as much, really struggling. So we might not be getting the whole picture when we hear from some of these companies in terms of how well things are going for, for consumers. Yeah, I think that's right. And we'll continue, obviously, to stay on this story. And all this is thematic to also what we're hearing from the Federal Reserve as the policymakers come out after that meeting last week where they again raise interest rates by 75 basis points. We heard from Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari over the weekend giving remarks to CBS's Face the Nation. I want to read you the quote of what he said yesterday, quote, whether we are technically in a recession or not doesn't change the fact that the Federal Reserve has its own work to do and we are committed to doing it. So even though our conversation just now, Akiko, inflation, the story might be improving with the gas and oil prices. The Federal Reserve president saying for their part, look, we're not going to let up on the pedal here. That does leave on the table the possibility of they could go even more aggressive. Jay Powell said that last week. That is very much a Pandora's box when it comes to policy for the rest of the year. Well, Neil Kashkari in that same interview saying that, look, it, it's, you know, as as we kind of last week, everybody was tripping over how exactly you define a recession. At the end of the day, if consumers are feeling like we're already in a recession, that also adds into the calculation here about, you know, what exactly that pullback looks like. It doesn't matter if the MBER is going to come out and suddenly say, yes, OK, we are officially in it. That's not really what the focus is. Yeah. At the end of the day, inflation hasn't necessarily peaked yet. There's no part of the Federal Reserve's function that says they're going to change policy based off of whether or not they're officially in a recession or not, right? It's not even the Fed's job to declare if they're in a recession. But either way, what was really interesting to see was that we saw the stock market rip higher mm -hmm. after the Fed meeting last Wednesday. 
perhaps it was a reading that, okay, well, the Fed chairman said at some point in the press conference, which is true, that maybe they could start cutting rates when they feel the time is appropriate. But what maybe markets miss is that we are still going to be hiking interest rates for probably the next few meetings to get to that point first. So whether or not markets are already pricing in what the terminal rate might be on the Federal Reserve's part is something that is very much an open question. But again, the story for the Fed is all about inflation. If the data shows, they're going to be data dependent, right? If the data shows inflation has not peaked, the beatings will continue until inflation goes down. That's the message from the Fed. Interesting note from uh, you and your team this morning. The headline was global recession, a clear and present danger. So how much of a risk uh, do you see that we do go into some form of synchronized global recession? Well, uh, I would say that the recent uh, economic data have been central banks' worst nightmare. That on the one hand, I'd say there's very clear evidence of a slowing in global demand. And on the other hand, uh, there's also clear evidence that inflation pressures are persisting. And you kind of put that together, it's really hard for central banks to fight that. And uh, I'm cautious to use the word, but it feels at the moment that we're going through a period, I expect it to be a transition, but transitionary stagflation. Uh, now, specifically in response to your question about a synchronized global downturn, right now we have a recession penciled in for Europe at the end of this year and early next year, and then a recession in the United States during the second half of 2023. Uh, given the data we're seeing and the vigor with which central banks are attacking inflation, uh, I think there's a reasonable chance, and we apprise that it's roughly 50%, that uh, globally uh, we all go down together, and it's a synchronized, uh, synchronized downturn. Nathan, I said a moment ago there are some concerns that we continue to sort of talk ourselves into a recession, so to speak. Do you think that that is what's happening, or do you think that there is real You know, on the one hand, Consumer spending, even if you, I was surprised, for example, to see the numbers from June show a tick up, even a very small one in real consumer spending. Um, consumer spending still seems to be okay, particularly on services. So is what, I guess it's just difficult to get to the bottom of what is going on here. It is, there are a lot of competing dynamics at the moment. And uh, as you say, I think that there is some substitution going on in the consumer sector. Uh, and uh, over the last couple of years, we spent uh, uh, a lot of money on goods, specifically discretionary goods. And uh, I think we're at a place where people are now substituting back towards services. And that, along with the ongoing strength of the labor market and wages, which we saw this morning as well, is supporting the consumer. But at the same time, this high inflation, and particularly for essentials, is reducing real incomes and destroying demand. And I think that is the worrisome uh, a process and the pernicious process that's uh, weighing on the economy. Now, in addition, as you say, sentiment matters. And uh, as we read the newspaper and uh, the stories are emphasizing the weakness in the economy, rather than some of these ongoing persistent signs of strength, is that having an impact on the way consumers see things? I think the answer is yes but there are also fundamental factors at work, and specifically this high inflation that's cutting into real incomes uh, and weighing on, on the consumer's uh, outlook. Okay, so Nathan, you basically answered my question with regard to how necessities and how much more those costs right now, how much that's actually changing where consumers can spend on other products or even services. But then I guess the other question uh, as a follow-up to that is how long will that be a dampener on some of the margins that companies right now are reporting? Yeah, I mean, in, in my mind, very clearly, uh, uh, consumers have no choice given the surging prices. They've got to spend more on necessities. They have uh, limited price elasticity there, so that's 
consuming a larger share of their budgets. They want to spend more on services because, you know, many families haven't gone on vacations or spent on other kinds of services over the last couple of years. And that's the reality, more necessities choosing to spend more on services. And it's this consumer discretionary sector uh, that's really uh, getting hit at the moment. Uh, in terms of margins, I think that's a really interesting dynamic. Uh, until recently, I think firms were generally able to pass through uh, the costs uh, to the consumer. But what we're starting to see is the consumer saying, whoa, there's a limit to how far we can go with this. And uh, the consumer is starting to pull back, substitute into uh, cheaper kinds of, of alternatives. Uh, and find other ways to limit expenditures given the reality of these rising prices. Nathan, Elizabeth Warren is, has been making the rounds this week saying that the Fed uh, risks putting the U.S. economy or, or creating a devastating recession. Those are her words. Do you see that happening? I think the Fed is behind the eight ball on this one where uh, if they don't act aggressively, the economy is going to be uh, plagued by high inflation. And at the end of the day, if a central bank cannot deliver price stability, it's not going to be able to deliver its other objectives. So the Fed's got to proceed and, and, and uh, go after the high inflation that we're seeing. And as it does so, are there recession risks? Absolutely. Uh, Jay Powell alludes to them uh, in his press conference and in his communication. He doesn't want to be too graphic about it, but absolutely there are recession risks. There's a case that this recession will not be devastating or severe. And in fact, that would be my expectation that many of the vulnerabilities that tend to amplify the severity of, of recessions are not in place. But nevertheless, we don't know how much contraction in activity, how much slowing in the economy ultimately may be necessary to get this inflation and this inflation uh, pressure that we're feeling out of the system. And there is a risk uh, that it could be a more severe downturn. But I really think that uh, the Fed has no choice uh, other than to continue to hike rates to fight inflation. Nathan, I want to just ask quickly about a, another area of inflation that has gotten less attention, not the CPI stuff, but wages, right? Um, because this has been a period where we have seen power to employees like we have not seen in decades in terms of not just rising wages, but union efforts, for example, people sort of dictating whether they want to be in the office or not and how they're working. How quickly do you think we could see a deterioration in that wage growth and that power that we've seen in employee hands? Right now, the labor market remains very tight. And I think it reflects the fact that there are some workers that have left the labor force as a result of COVID and, and other factors. And it's not clear what it's going to take to get them back. And at the same time, I think firms have learned that labor is valuable and they are demanding labor uh, uh, more vigorously than we might have thought, given where the economy uh, uh, is otherwise. And it kind of put that together. And that is a tight labor market with uh, upward pressure on wages. Now, when does that process start to soften? When does it start to diminish? I think ultimately it depends back on spending and, uh, and the strength of the, the consumer. If the consumer is willing to uh, continue to draw down savings buffers and so forth, I think that supports the economy and gives firms scope to continue to, to, to keep hiring. But this relationship between the labor market and consumption, and they kind of drive each other. Right now, that's the nexus, it's particularly services consumption that's critical, that's driving the economy. And if we're going to somehow skate through this without a recession, we're going to have to see a relatively robust labor market and the consumer continuing to spend, maybe drawing down, as I said, some of those savings buffers and other financial resources that were accumulated during the pandemic. Nathan Sheets, City Global Chief Economist. Always good to get some time with you. Have a great weekend. 
I'm Julie Hyman with Brad Smith and Brian Sazi, and we are looking at futures that are indicating a very slightly higher open on this Friday morning. This is after we got some economic data that we want to talk about in just a minute. But first, let's run through the futures real quick. We are seeing that little bit 17 point gain for the Dow futures, S&P futures, looking at a bigger gain of about a half of 1%, a dipping earlier after the data and then coming back to some extent. By the way, it looks like we are set for the best month on the S&P 500 that we've seen since November of 2020. That's how it looks in the futures. And then the NASDAQ 100 futures indicating a gain of three quarters of 1%. And a quick check as well of what's going on in the bond market. Uh, and we are seeing a bump up in yields, a little one here to 2.71%. We did get some news this morning on the economic front that does show uh, maybe costs are not necessarily moderating, or maybe they didn't in June at least. The PCE, uh, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Deflator, that is the preferred inflation measure of the Federal Reserve, coming in um, with a 4.8% gain. That is the core figure, and it's a tenth of a percentage point hotter than estimated. We also got the Employment Cost Index, which is designed to be a sort of more comprehensive view of employment besides just hourly wages. It, too, was a little bit hotter than had been estimated. So initially, we saw a little bit of a dip in the futures, and then we saw them come up again here this morning. So this is something, obviously, you guys, the people have been watching really closely when it comes to the inflation figures. Yes, these are for June. It's a little bit older data. We're getting some confidence data coming out at 10 a.m. that we're going to be watching. But all of this feeding into the inflation picture, even as Elon Musk says, maybe the worst is over for inflation. Maybe it is. Who are we to argue with somebody putting rockets into the sky? But one thing that a lot of people are still wondering about is whether or not America is in a recession or not. Now, that's the lingering question among the nation's leaders and economists in recent days. And despite a number of factors weighing on the economy, including today's less than ideal GDP data, those in charge seem convinced that the future is promising. And that includes Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who spoke on the matter earlier. Take a listen. Most economists and most Americans have a similar definition of recession substantial job losses and mass layoffs, businesses shutting down, private sector activities slowing considerably, family budgets under immense strain, in some, a broad-based weakening of our economy. That is not what we're seeing right now when you look at the economy. Well, joining us now to offer more insight on the state of the economy is Princeton University Professor of Economics and Public Affairs and former Vice Chair of the Federal Reserve, Alan Blinder. Alan, thank you so much for joining us today. So obviously uh, trying to assess what we're seeing with this. Good, thank you. Trying to assess what we're seeing in terms of this technical recession. How should this be viewed in light of as what Fed Chair, Fed Chair Powell was saying about the strength of the labor market? Well, as has been true since the pandemic started, we're going on more than two years now. Data keep coming in in confusing and unusual ways. So, for example, to your question, we don't usually see two quarters of G. I don't think we've ever seen, frankly, two quarters of GDP decline, which we've just registered, while jobs are still being created, and not just created at a very healthy pace. You're talking about over three hundred thousand jobs per month. Whereas for replacement purposes, because the population is getting bigger, the norm is probably more like 100,000 a month. So it, in, in a real sense, the job market is not only tight, but getting tighter. And yet the GDP is showing these declines. It's very weird. Now, this number that just came out uh, today is dominated by uh, decumulation of inventories, inventory Without the inventories, that was basically a minus 1% number. Without the inventories, it would have been closer to a plus 1% number, which is still not strong, but it's not negative either. I spent far too much time trying to figure that out. And, and it, it appears there were 1947, we had back-to-back -back GDP contractions without going to recession. That's the only one I could find in all that time, Alan. But the question is, are you seeing... I was only two years old at the time. I don't remember. <laughs> I was not going to go there, my friend. Um, are you seeing any signs that the, that the Fed is succeeding? Yes. 
and you're seeing it not where people are looking for it. People are looking for it in inflation going down much more rapidly than history suggests should happen when the Fed tightens. You do think it'll happen, but it takes a while. But we really see it having an impact right away is in the most interest sensitive piece of the economy, which is housing. Every indicator of housing from traffic through uh, realtors to housing starts to uh, new sales and resales, and everything is down on, uh, on the housing front, which is where you expect the Fed to have its biggest effect. And Alan, you were vice chair of the Fed when the bank was tightening monetary policy back in the 90s, 94, 95. From your perspective, when you were at the Fed at that time, what do you think the Fed today can learn from what you guys did back in the 90s? Well, I think what they can learn, I wrote about this a little bit in my Wall Street Journal piece the other day, is uh, patience. Uh, it's hard to be patient. We humans are not naturally patient, although I must say Fed people are a lot more patient than market people uh, are. But they're not going to have the effect they want on inflation for a while. They have to view it as they put something in the pipeline and it takes a while to come out the other end. There's a tendency historically, which we did not do in 94, 95, the episode you're alluding to, to look around, say nothing, not enough is happening, let's do more, and to overdo it. It can go in either direction. You can overdo it on easing, you can overdo it on tightening. That I think is the main lesson today's Fed people could learn from our experience in the mid 90s. And Alan, I want to talk to you about the consumer and obviously how, how middle income Americans are doing, because a lot of people are saying, look, we pretty much telegraphed this recession, in fact, perhaps spoke it into existence because of the fears about it. What is this doing to middle class Americans and what should they be expecting now with this now back to back 75 basis point hike? Yeah, well, I think middle class Americans are feeling the inflation, which reduces their purchasing power. You know, wages are going up at more rapid rates than has been true in recent years, but they're not keeping up with inflation. So the real purchasing power of wages is falling and working uh, Americans feel that. It's not an illusion, it's actually happening uh, to them. That's one reason, and it may be the main reason, hard to know, but it's certainly one reason why consumer spending is weakening. Now, it didn't plummet in the second uh, quarter, but it's kind of on the weak side, and that's the worrisome uh, sign. I watched your little clip of Secretary Yellen before, and I agree with her. But but the there is some, there is reason to worry in the second quarter numbers, and that that's the main one to me: the weak consumer. Indeed, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren wrote in the Wall Street Journal the other day that low unemployment and high inflation are painful, but a Fed manufactured recession that puts millions of Americans out of work without addressing high prices would be far worse. What do you make of that argument? And how many jobs will indeed have to be lost in your estimation for us to stay out of a recession? Well, that last is a $64 trillion question. Uh, I don't know. The Fed is trying to be as gentle as they can. I want to contrast this. Some people are drawing parallels to the early 80s, when uh, the late 90s, the late 70s and early 80s, when the inflation rate went really high. The Fed then really had a clamp down. Things were going out of control. Inflation was getting embedded in a whole variety of uh, ways, and millions of jobs were lost. Today's Fed is trying to have a much gentler touch. Uh, Jay Powell has talked about a softish landing. So it's conceivable, starting from where we are, with such a very low unemployment rate and such high levels of job creation, that we could do this without real job losses or, or maybe minimal job losses, just fewer gains than we would have if the Fed was not slowing the economy. But slowing the economy does mean slowing job growth. Uh, you know, that's almost arithmetic. So, Alan, right now, as, a bet, as it's been over the past two months, we have two back-to-back -back 75 basis point hikes. You were talking about the importance of being patient right now for the Fed to take a slower approach. What does that slower approach look like in the fall? Are we talking a 50 basis point hike, 25 basis point hike? Lay that out for us. 
So I'm gonna answer your question, but first I'm gonna preface it by saying nobody really knows because it depends on what's going on with the economy, both on the real side and the inflation side. Based on currently popular forecasts, my guess would be that the Fed does another 50 basis points in September and then steps back to look at its handiwork. So it might stop there or pause there for a while and see what happens, or it might just uh, ratchet down to 25 basis points. Subtle questions like that for September and for after September certainly can't be answered in July, and the Fed's not going to try to uh, answer them. But I think it's going to depend on how the economy behaves, how much it slows down, and especially on how much inflation falls. Mr. Blinder, always great to have you. Uh, come back to us here at Yahoo Finance. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you. All right, well, now let's bring in Milton Ezrati, Vested Chief Economist, to weigh in on Powell's comments and the Fed decision. So, Milton, that 75 basis point hike, how is it in terms of is it enough? Is it too little? And what did you pass through in terms of the comments that you heard from Powell? Well, it was certainly easier to listen to Powell now than it was last year. He's, he's talking straight. He, he refuses to say that there won't be a recession. Um, uh, he's, conf he's hopeful about the soft landing. He's being very, playing it very close to the chest about how much, uh, rates, uh, are going to have to go up. Um, I think he's soft peddling. I think that if the, unless we get very lucky with the inflation, and that would be very lucky, he's going to have to raise rates a good deal more, and I think the market will be disappointed uh, if they think that this is the end or close to the end. Uh, keep in mind that even with these rate increases, um, you're still uh, paying less on your loan than the lender is losing on inflation. So effectively, you're making real return for the use of someone else's money. Uh, the Fed has to change that to say that financial conditions are really tight, and it needs to make them tight to beat the inflation. So so uh, my own assessment is that he's going to have a very hard time, in fact, a nearly impossible time, uh, giving us the soft landing. Um, he has to soft pedal that now, not because um, uh, he's hiding anything, but because he's going to look at the data. If we get lucky on inflation, we may avoid this, but that would be very good luck. Milton, it sounds like you're expecting we would likely be headed towards a recession if we're not already in one. How deep of a recession do you think we'd likely see? Well, that's an interesting question. I think if the Fed does its job and raises rates enough and tightens financial conditions enough to avoid a recession, uh, to excuse me, to stop the inflation, or at least start us on the road to stopping the inflation, then we would have a relatively short uh, recession and, and come back from it relatively quickly. If the Fed loses its nerve and doesn't do enough, and the inflation itself causes the recession, which is entirely possible, inflation causes a great many economic dislocations, then it could be a long, painful recession. So in this sense, I'm, I'm applauding Chairman Powell's repeated statement that the most important thing is that the Fed do what is necessary to stop the inflation. I don't think they've done enough yet, um, but they, they have to go cautiously. Uh, I think they're going to have to do a lot more. Despite and what he calls... It leads to short recession. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No problem. D despite uh, what he says is robust job growth, more than 400,000 jobs created on, uh, per month on average, he does say, Powell, that he's seeing some signs uh, of you know, housing, business investment, consumer spending shrinking. Do you see signs that the Fed is succeeding? And between now and September, do you think that 9.1% print will begin to come down? That would be good luck. Uh, because inflation moves at a lag, uh, and it's responding to years of, uh, of money creation, uh, as well as the supply constraints and the more immediate effects. So, yes, I think we could see lower numbers, but we're not going to see acceptable numbers for quite some time. Uh, and I don't think there's any way to avoid that. This is built into the system, and uh, I'm not going to join the transitory crowd, or not, neither am I ready to forecast that we've done enough. So I think we're going, we may see the numbers come down a little bit. We, we may see it fall 
uh, considerably. Maybe it's seven and a half percent or seven percent inflation that is still unconscionably high. Uh, so the Fed's going to have to continue to keep the pressure on to do its job. Um, I do see the mix that Chairman Powell uh, talked about, and I would be loath to say that we're in a recession now, uh, but this is a definition game. I think the important thing to realize is the economy is weak and weakening, and if the Fed does its job, or if the inflation gets worse, then it's going to get weaker sooner. So by September, by the end of the year, I think we will be talking about recession without the reservations that Chairman Powell uh, expressed earlier uh, in the day. And was there anything that you hoped that Chair Powell would go into more detail on in his comments? Uh, I would love for him to tell us what the Fed really thinks, because they have their deliberations and clearly there's a number of forecasts. No one can see the future. But I know he can't do that. And I was actually delighted to see his reluctance to do forward guidance. It's as much as saying that we don't know exactly where we are and we're going to have to go with the data, which was honesty that we haven't seen from Washington in a while. Milton, the reaction that we're seeing in the bond markets today, the reaction that we're seeing in the equity markets, I know you're focused on the economy, but just your reaction to this, because I think a lot of people thought that largely what we heard from J-PAL today had already been priced in. Um, well, I think we had priced uh, uh, the, the, the equity market has been discounting a recession of some sort for quite some time. So bouncing a little bit in this environment, particularly with the Fed soft peddling things, particularly with the fact that the Fed didn't raise rates any faster than the market long expected, uh, it's not surprising that the market would show a little optimism. Um, but I think uh, if, if it's hoping that this is it, it's going to be disappointed. Don't hold your breath, indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Milton Azrati. Appreciate your insights here. Brian Chung is outside the Fed awaiting the decision from Jerome Powell, which we expect, Brian, a 75-point hike. Yes, Dave. Well, the Federal Reserve just making that announcement. The Federal Reserve has officially raised interest rates by 0.75%. That was largely as expected. Again, markets pricing in a chance of about 75% chance of that happening. Now, when it comes to changes to the statement itself, really not much change when you talk about recent indicators of spending and production have softened. That's the only new sentence in the statement. Again, I'll read that one more time. Recent indicators of spending and production have softened. That might be the closest that we'll get to the Federal Reserve acknowledging that perhaps Perhaps there is a slowdown happening in the economy, not en masse, but interesting to note that language is in the statement. But beyond that, really nothing else in here. The Fed continuing to point to Russia's war against Ukraine as one element to upward price pressures. Of course, the Fed sees a demand side of that as also part of the picture, which is the reason why it feels it has to continue to raise interest rates. Keep in mind, the Fed is now targeting interest rates between two and a quarter and two and a half percent. And they say, quote, they anticipate that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate. Translation, bus doesn't stop here. That language was the same as we had seen from the Fed in June. But beyond that, the Fed continuing to acknowledge food and energy prices are high. Job gains do remain robust. So the Fed's balancing act as it tries to raise interest rates without triggering any sort of job losses does remain. But again, the big headline today. 0.75 percentage point increase from the Fed, second in a row. Decision was unanimous. Guys. Brian, just talk to us about the unprecedented uh, action here from the Fed. It's been quite some time since we've seen the Fed get so aggressive. And then, of course, just your perspective on what this means that we will likely see heading into the fall, because inflation is still at its highest level that we've seen in about 40 years. Yeah, well, when we talk about just the inflationary reaction, we have to remember that the Federal Reserve has been pretty insistent that it can't just simply stop raising interest rates here. For what it's worth, where we're at right now at about 2.25 to 2.5 percent is roughly the estimate of where economists say is neutral, meaning that any further interest rate hikes past this point could have more bite into inflation, which is going to be very important when you consider that the last read we got on inflation on CPI was 9.1 percent on a year over year basis. That hasn't shown signs of letting up quite yet. However, what we don't know is what is the Federal Reserve going to do next? There's nothing in this statement that says, well, in the next meeting, which, by the way, is going to happen at the end of September, is it going to be 50 or 75 or one percentage point? We don't know. And that's why all eyes are going to be on the Fed's uh, Fed chairman's press conference at 2.30. What will Jay Powell tell us? Will he give us guidance on what happens next? That's going to be very important to see how he can shape inflex inflation expectations with these recessionary worries out there.
And we know that before when we got that CPI data that came out, people were wondering, look, could it be 100 basis points? But obviously closer to this decision, we did see that 10 percent. But but it's interesting to see that this was a unanimous decision. Was that was that surprising to you? Well, it was surprising when you consider that uh, you actually had one member dissenting from the last decision. So in June, when the Fed made the abrupt change last minute to go from 50 basis points to 75 basis points, you actually saw Esther George, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, dissent against that. She wanted a smaller rate hike of the 0.5 uh, half a percentage point that markets were expecting prior to that meeting, which, by the way, was a bit of a surprise because those Fed watchers have noted for some time that she has tended to favor larger interest rate increases as opposed to smaller ones. But in this decision, which which, by the way, she's still a voter. She did go along with what the Federal Reserve ultimately went with, which was that three quarters of a percentage point increase. So again, everyone's on board. Keep in mind, we also have a few new members of the Federal Reserve Board, uh, Michael S. Barr, and then also Susan Collins from the Boston Fed uh, joining the committee between uh, June and July. So they were also uh, in line when it comes to that. Of course, we'll have to hear all the Fed commentary after this meeting to see if the other non-voting members of the committee also supported this decision. Yeah, really surprising given the amount, Brian, of business leaders and analysts who wanted a 100-point hike. So I expect the name Janet Yellen to pop up in this press conference, in particular when defining a recession. How do you expect the Fed chair to tap dance around the actual definition of a, of a recession given the GDP number coming tomorrow? <laughs> well, Dave, we'll have to see in about, I don't know, 27 minutes or so. When we talk about Jay Powell's approach to all of this, though, you would probably expect him to say what he's already been saying, which is the Fed is going to do its part to try to land this plane without any issues. Of course, that seems to be a picture that's getting a little bit gloomier and shows that the job of actually a smooth landing is going to be a lot harder than the Fed had projected perhaps earlier in the year. Now, of course, the Fed is going to say, at least for right now, it is going to continue to raise interest rates. But again, who knows how long and persistent the war in Ukraine is going to be on energy prices? Who knows what the inflation expectations are going to look like as Americans continue to talk about the R word? How does that shape in any sort of behavior when it comes to consumption or businesses when it comes to investment? So I think the Fed chairman in a few minutes is probably going to say something to the effect of, look, as far as they're knitting, they stick to interest rate increases. And we know that up until today, monetary policy was still very, very largely accommodated because it was below that 2.4 percent that people estimate as still stimulative to the economy. After today, that might now start to be restrictive. So that's probably going to be a talking point. And again, we'll have to listen in in about 25 minutes or so. And Brian, it's also a tough balancing act here with the Fed, because the other question out there is how much hiking can the economy absorb at this point? Because the Fed still very aggressive, as we see very high inflation, but the economy is slowing down a little bit. So it'll be interesting, I guess, to see how Jay Powell is able to walk that line as well, because he doesn't want to get too aggressive in the fact that then that could potentially spook the markets. And that is exactly the reason why the Fed didn't just in in instantly raise interest rates to say three and a half or four percent already, because the markets are not quite ready for that. And in fact, one big difference between this meeting and the last meeting is that for the first time, you're starting to see uh, the 10 year yield price in the chance of a Fed cut at some point. Now, some of this may have been natural because, you know, the Fed couldn't raise interest rates forever. But uh, as of the last meeting, you still saw the continued rip up in the 10 year. And essentially over the last six weeks, you have seen the 10 year fall down by about seven. 75 basis points. I'd be interested to see, I don't have a computer right in front of me, of what the tenure is doing right now. But of course, with that action over the last six weeks, that is bond market traders pricing in a high likelihood that at some point the Fed's going to have to do a U-turn on all of this. How abrupt is that going to be? I think that turn is going to depend on how hard we go into a recession if that does end up happening. You have a lot on Wall Street saying, well, Maybe then the second half of next year is when that U-turn happens. But look, I'm starting to see some uh, reports and some analysts that are saying, hey, it's possible that they're going to start to pull that call up to maybe the first half of next year. You're seeing a bit of a reaction here in the 10-year as we pull that up. It's still not a heck of a lot of movement, at least just yet. I don't think you can say it off just about 2.7%. Americans are reacting to inflation that has reached highs not seen since 1981. A new survey conducted by Yahoo Finance and our friends at Morning Consult shows that while gas prices are getting the headlines, it may not actually be the biggest inflation concern among Americans. Joining us now with the poll results and political perspective, Yahoo Finance's own Rick Newman, senior columnist here at Yahoo Finance. Rick, what do we know from the results so far? What were we able to extrapolate? Well, I've paid a lot of attention to how people feel about gasoline. Uh, one of the things that surprised me here is people are obviously concerned about the price of gas, which 
uh, hit $5.02 uh, in the middle of June. But the majority in this poll actually say they're confident they can afford gas right now. 63% uh, said they're able to afford gas right now. It's interesting because uh, a, a significant number of people say they're worried they may not be able to afford gas in the future. So that's people telling us, yeah, they, they can afford it right now, but they're concerned things are going to get out of hand a month or two from now and the price is going to go up and they're not going to be able to uh, handle the cost of gas. So people are worried things are going to get better. That's one of the things that clearly comes across here. But there are other things that people have a harder time paying for. They are uh, struggling to save money or put any money into retirement savings. And then child care is the one thing where people say they have the lowest confidence they can afford uh, child care today for those people who need it. Only 42% said they can, uh, they're confident they can afford child care. Uh, and of course, for families with kids, uh, they sp probably spend a lot more on child care than they do on gasoline. So, you know, we in the media, we've been fixated on gas prices, but uh, families have a lot of other uh, budgetary uh, concerns. Indeed they do, Rick. And I wrote up uh, what the poll found with, uh, as it pertains to back to school supplies. 50% of those polls said they won't be able to afford back to school supplies and they're gonna have to cut back on a vacation to afford those supplies. And another 28% said they may not be able to afford school trips for their kids. So you put all this together, none of this could be good for the president, right? Well, I mean, this is a bit of a Rorschach test, uh, honestly. So you do, we do have, um, a majority saying they can afford most categories of uh, things that ranging from necessities to non-necessities like vacation. But there clearly are, are, are families that are under stress. Now that's, that's always true. And this is the first time we've done this with Morning Consult. So we're gonna build a baseline here over time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, look, there are families under stress, but I think once again, people really worry that things are gonna get worse uh, a few months from now, and that could be inflation gets worse, or we have this recession that we've been trying to talk ourselves into, uh, and that people feel maybe their their incomes are not safe and their jobs are not safe. So um, one thing that comes through crystal clear is people are just in a in a bad mood, <laughs> and uh, that is Biden's. Uh, that is a big problem for President Biden. All right, Yahoo Finance's own Rick Newman there breaking down the results of our latest survey with Morning Consult and Yahoo Finance. Thanks so much, Rick. Hi, guys. But again, inflation is not just a domestic story. It's also part of the global growth story. Another news headline that crossed this morning, the International Monetary Fund painting a grim picture for 2022 as it again slashes its forecast, now projecting 3.2% growth this year. That's a noticeable downgrade from its previous projections. And the big reason, global inflation. The IMF expecting that prices this year will rise 6.6% in advanced economies and 9.5% in emerging market and developing economies. Here with more on that report is the IMF chief economist, Pierre Olivia Garinchas, joining us live on the program. Great to have you on the program. Uh, just walk us through a little bit more exactly what the weight is of global inflation on the forecast, a noticeable downgrade from the last round of forecasts in April. How worried are you about global inflation tipping us into a global recession, perhaps? Well, good morning. And you're right. I mean, pushing inflation has been one of the three factors we've highlighted behind the downward revision in our in our uh, projections update. Uh, and the way inflation uh, plays out here is that it's, of course, it's eroding uh, purchasing power for, for consumers and households. Uh, and so that's leading to uh, uh, less demand. But it's also affecting their views on the outlook. It's creating uncertainty. It can increase uh, uh, their sense that maybe the future is less certain, is less secure. And it leads central banks, as we've seen the Fed doing in central banks around the world, really pretty much in every country, maybe except China and Japan, to tighten monetary policy. And that tightening of monetary policy is also going to slow down economic activity. So that's one of the three main drivers of our, of our revision. Uh, so let's break down some of what we're seeing that where we're seeing that inflation come through from obviously energy, a big one that we've been watching very closely. When you look at a place like Europe, there's still a lot of questions clouding the outlook there about what that supply is going to look like, both on oil as well as natural gas. How do you assess what how significant a headwind that's likely to be um, as we look into next year? 
Well, in the European context, uh, the, this is where the second factor is, is playing out, and this is the, the impact, uh, the continued impact of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and the impact it has on, on energy, on energy markets. And so we're revising down also our growth projections for the euro area, especially in 2023, in fact. In 2023, we are projecting that growth will slow down to about 1.2% for the euro area. But we're also flagging that there are important risks to the downside uh, related to the supply of uh, gas from, from Russia to the euro area. And if we were in a scenario where those, uh, those Russian uh, gas flows to Europe are fully shut down, then there would be another, another layer, if you want, in terms of the downward revision, and we're anticipating that it would knock off another uh, roughly 0.8 percentage point of economic activity in the area. So this is sort of the second, the second major factor that leads us to revise our projection is the, the slowdown we see in the euro area related to the, the impact of the war. Well, as a follow up, I want to ask about the central bank policies around all of these headwinds. When we talk about, for example, the uh, European Central Bank hiking rates last week, the Federal Reserve having an important meeting tomorrow where they're also expected to raise interest rates, that's all supposed to get prices down. But as you just outlined, a lot of the price increases are due to something that's completely out of the central bank control, which is what's happening over in Eastern Europe. So do you worry about a central bank policy mistake here and hard landings, not just in the United States, but in other parts of the world as well? Well, well, look, there, there, there are different sources behind the inflation, inflation numbers that we're seeing right now. And certainly, there are things related to energy and, and, and high oil prices and gas prices, for instance. Uh, but there are also, and supply chain disruptions, there are also demand factors. The fact that a lot of households came out from the pandemic with excess savings, what we call excess savings. They may not be seen as excess savings from the perspective of these households. So we have a combination of factors. But let's step back and think about where we were in terms of monetary policy back at the end of 2021. Conditions were extremely accommodating because central banks were trying to support their economies during the pandemic. And so it's only natural that at the very least we remove that level of support when we're moving away from the pandemic. And at the same time, we're facing these extremely high levels of inflation. So central banks have to tighten. They don't really have a choice at this point, regardless of where inflation is coming from. And we actually look at what a number of them are doing, and we think that this is, this is more or less appropriate given the environment. So they don't really have a choice here. Now, does that mean that emerging market central banks also don't have a choice here? We're seeing a strong dollar weighing around the world. I mean, this is raising perhaps some chatter of, could we see a 1994 like Mexican peso crisis? Could we see a 1997 like Asian financial crisis again as some of these countries maybe have difficulty dealing with uh, a devaluing currency domestically? Do you see that as an issue as well? We, we certainly see a lot of financial tightening around the world, and it is having a serious effect on, on emerging markets. We see, as you mentioned, we see the strength of the U.S. dollar. That's actually implying more inflation in a number of countries because they import goods that are invoiced in dollars, and so they see higher prices for these goods. Uh, it makes it harder to service dollar debt. We're seeing capital flow out of these countries, emerging market uh, economies in particular, and we're seeing spreads increase. So all of this is adding uh, to the pressure. At the same time, we are not seeing disorderly market conditions right now in the EM space. Uh, what we are seeing is a number of countries that have actually improved their policy framework, the way they conduct their monetary policy, the way they manage their exchange rate, uh, let it adjust when uh, conditions change, as we've seen, uh, the way they uh, try to use their instruments that they have at their disposal to protect their financial sector, to prevent uh, banking meltdown and the financial sector uh, panic. And so, so far, we haven't seen really uh, uh, any disorderly response in financial markets. So I want to say, yes, there is tightening. Yes, there is pressure. But as of now, we are not seeing anything like the taper tantrum of 2013 or the Asian financial crisis or even the, uh, the Mexican crisis of 94-95. Let's t uh, talk specifically about China. You're projecting growth of 3.3 percent. That is well off the 5.5 percent that the government has set for itself this year. Um, obviously, the, the zero COVID policy playing into some of that as well. But I I wonder when you look at some of the headwinds, the risk factors in China, what concerns you the most? And we've been also watching what's been playing out in the property markets really closely. It sort of feels like the government is reversing its policy to really double down on some of that debt they were trying to slim back on because of where the economy is right now. Yes, there's been a, the, that's the third sort of factor leading to our downward revision is China. And you know, when you put it all together, the U.S., 
the euro area and China, the three largest economies in the world, uh, being revised down. This is, you know, this is what leads us to our gl gloomy outlook, if you want. But on China specifically, we are projecting 3.1 percent growth in 2022. And just as a point of reference, this is the lowest growth number since 1976 in China outside of the pandemic. So this is really something that is big news. And it's on the back of, as you pointed out, the COVID-19 outbreaks and lockdowns that we've seen in the first and second quarter. And also also the slowdown in terms of the, uh, the real estate sector. So looking forward, the good news about China is that it has a lot of policy space and it's not facing uh, very strong inflation pressures. So it can remain more accommodating in terms of its policy stance. And in particular, fiscal policy can play a role to try to support the economy and in particular vulnerable households that might be suffering in the current environment. So we're seeing that there's room for China's sort of rebound in the second half of the year and in 2020. And if we shift over to the United States, I mean, they had a pretty swift downgrade in this report compared to the April projections. Does that imply that you see a higher risk of a hard landing here in the United States? Well, the way we would characterize it is that under our baseline projections, there is a narrower path. Uh, the growth is, as you show uh, uh, on your screen, is, uh, is, is projected at 2.3% <laughs> in 2022. Then we're expecting a slowdown on the back of this tightening of monetary policy and uh, also in the context of still elevated inflation to about 1%. But the Q4 on Q4 growth in 2023 for the U.S. is estimated at about 0.6 percent in our projections. And 0.6 percent is a low number. It wouldn't take much of a, a downside a materialization of a downside risk to sort of knock off the, the U.S. from, uh, uh, from you know, having positive growth. So we're seeing a very narrow path going forward, not necessarily a recession under the baseline, but certainly a very vulnerable situation. Certainly a lot of layers to all of this. Uh, IMF, IMF Chief Economist Pierre-Olivier Garinchas, it's good to have your time today. Uh, appreciate you stopping by. Well, let's take a look at one trending ticket. There you have it. That is your closing bell for July 25th. So let's take a look at how the major indices fared. A mixed day ending there. As you can see, the Dow there down about a third of a percent, losing about 90 points. The S&P 500, just about five points up there. Just very slightly, relatively flat there, though. And the tech-heavy Nasdaq, though, the only one that couldn't make it into the green today, down almost half a percent as we take a look at some of that. But let's bring in our market guests to break down some of this market action. We have Cameron Dawson. New Edge Wealth Chief Economist, Chief Investment Officer, and Scott Ladner, Horizon Investments Chief Investment Officer. So a big welcome to you both. Obviously, a huge week ahead in terms of earnings, the Fed, and of course, what we're going to find out in terms of whether we're in a recession or not. Cameron, what are you focusing on this week? Because there's a lot of noise going on. Yeah, I think it's a mixture of watching what the companies say on earnings as well as in the Fed. So let's take the first one with company earnings. We'll really be looking at the forward guidance for earnings because it's likely that second quarter earnings might have held in okay. We didn't get many pre-announcements. And we've also seen fairly okay reactions to stock prices in these earnings reports. So it really is all about those guidance. And it's about the consumer, what companies are saying is happening within the consumer. Are they feeling the pinch from inflation, as well as in the manufacturing economy? We've seen some really weak data out of PMIs, and that could indicate that some of those big industrial or other manufacturing commodity companies could face a little bit more pressure as we look to later in the year. So it's really all eyes on earnings through the rest of this week. That's a great point, Scott, uh, that Cameron makes. So many of the data that, that we do sift through is lagging. We need more uh, leading indicators. What's the number you're watching? How do you expect the market to react to it? You know, I, I think Cameron got it about right. That looking like not only what the, what the earnings were, which obviously looking in the rear of your mirror and like understanding what the currency effects are going to be on the big tech companies uh, will, will end up being important. But what they, what they say about the future, what they're saying about how the consumer is behaving, because we know the consumer is in, is in really pretty good objective financial shape. But what we also know is that they feel like garbage. You know, they feel terrible. And so if that feeling of feeling not very confident, not very good, if that translates into, into spending lower, you know, not spending as much, not going on vacation, uh, just generally retrenching, 
and you know, pretty much recession is in the cards. And so just listening to how companies are characterizing the behavior of the consumer, like what they're seeing uh, as we as we come into the later summer is gonna be fairly important. You know, so that's that's the one thing we're looking at. Yeah, the, the other big thing obviously is the Fed. Um, so you know what is what is how is Powell going to characterize what is likely to be a 75 basis point hike, uh, but you know and it could that be in 100 because you never you know frankly you never know right now. Um, but but how does he characterize how the how the committee and how he is thinking about policy in September, October, November? Um, you know what kind of things are they needing to see in terms of like progress towards their inflation goals? Uh, because when when the scales start to normalize, like we're like right now the Fed only cares about inflation, but they have two mandates: it's inflation and growth and employment. When those scales start to be able to normalize, then we then we have a chance for a pivot. Um, but you know we're we're not close right now. But getting some sense as to when that may come will end up being the other important thing we think this week. And Cameron, let me just get your sense for earnings season. Uh, we're expecting uh, some people are expecting a tsunami of downgrades. We've already seen that for Snap. Um, we've talked to an Amazon analyst earlier today. What are you seeing, and how are you making sense of this? Yeah, I mean, I think going back to the consumer, because it all is very important for the U.S. economy, it's 70 percent of the economy. We're seeing signs that they're holding up OK. The banks talked about credit card spending remaining really strong. We also saw really good signs out of travel demand. American Express talked about really strong travel and leisure. And the airlines, though they, they had issues this quarter, it wasn't because of demand. It was because they couldn't keep up with demand because of disruptions in supply constraints. Now, there is a little bit of fraying that we're seeing at the low end and low end consumer. That's where we're seeing areas like AT&T talking about people delaying paying their phone bill, Verizon having to give more incentives to get people to sign up for plans. And Capital One was really interesting on this very point of the lower income consumer. They said that Consumers are feeling the pressure from inflation, but they're not seeing a big tick up in delinquencies or credit charge offs yet. And that's because those are very correlated to employment and employment is a lagging indicator. It takes time for companies to fire workers. But if the trends that we've had over the last month of initial jobless claims continue, they're actually up 50 percent from the May low. If those trends continue to greater initial jobless claims and more unemployment, we could find ourselves in a scenario where we're starting to see a little more broad weakness within the consumer and those delinquencies and charge offs really do start to tick up. And Scott, obviously a lot of discussion about whether we're in a recession, whether or not we're just a slowing economy, as we heard from Janet Yellen earlier today. How much does that matter in terms of investment strategy right now, though, Scott? Well, look, it, it matters because if you're if you're in a recession, then you expect earnings to decline. Uh, if we're just going through a growth slowdown, a kind of a mid-cycle slowdown like we saw in the mid-90s, um, then that, you know, those declines would be expected to be much smaller. And so, you know, really, you know, whether or not we are actually in a recession, you know, I know technical talk, uh, you, know, you know, aside, you know, it, it really is just all about like how much our earnings, how much do earnings have to correct? How much do they have to come down based on how, how, how much slower the economy is going to be? Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's why it's important on the investment side. We, we would uh, urge one word of caution, though. You know, everything's been happening so much faster. This cycle these last few years you know everything has just been uh, you know the, the last two years about being pulling everything forward you know everything's just happening faster and faster and faster so if we are actually in a recession or if we or, or if we're in the, the cusp of one we think we're probably gonna have to position for getting out of it even faster than we than we have in the past and so we just caution it to uh, you know investors to think you know that the recessions last a certain amount of time historically because that's what they've done we're, you know we probably are going to be in a place now where we have to react a little more quickly and position a little bit more uh you know more front-footed as we think, as we see the, the, the economy turn back out, which probably will happen sometime next year. And Cameron, Jenna Yellen's point is basically that, look, we, we can't be in a recession when it's not broad based with the employment market this strong, with almost 400,000 jobs created every month, a 3.6% unemployment. Do you agree with that? And have the markets already essentially priced in a mild recession? Well, we don't think that the markets have priced in a recession at 17 times earnings and earnings that are still about 10% growth on a year over year basis for 22, another 9% in 23 and 24. 
that certainly isn't recessionary. That 17 times earnings, usually during a recession, you see earnings expectations, sorry, earnings multiples go well below average and average is around 16 times. So we don't think the market has fully priced in that recessionary scenario. Now, the question, if we're in a recession already, I think that this is a really good point that we should discuss, which is that the kind of basic term of two quarters of sequential GDP negative growth really isn't the technical term for a recession. Usually it encompasses something more like consumption as well as in the employment market. And those things, again, are lagging. So there are signs that we are slowing materially. And I think it's the question is if the slowing areas that we have, which is in manufacturing, it's in housing, it's in the consumption of certain large durable goods, if those areas have contagion and spread out to the broader economy and hit that 70% of broad consumer spending, which would likely result in lower unemployment, sorry, lower employment, as well as lower consumption overall. So it really remains to be seen, but it certainly seems like we're heading in a direction where growth is going to be significantly lower. Get a better sense in a couple of days. Great stuff, Cameron Dawson and Scott Lauder. Appreciate you both being here. As markets right now pointing down on the day, uh, the, the Dow losing about 68 points, the S&P down slightly, as is the NASDAQ 124-point drop with about 50 minutes to go in trading. Let's talk about this with Charles Schwab, Chief Global Investment Strategist, Jeffrey Kleintop, joining us to lay the foundation for what we can expect for markets this big week. It is an enormous week. It's good to see you, sir. We're talking about a third of S&P 500 companies report earnings. We've got the Fed. We've got the GDP. What one number is most important to you this week, and how will markets react to it? Clearly have a bit of an audio wash. Uh, can you uh, unmute yourself, though, my friend? You'd think I'd there be you go, used buddy. to this by now. <laughs> Sorry about that. All good. Uh, it, it's actually some of the inventory numbers we're going to get. I know that's off most people's radar screens, but listen, that's what's most crucial right here. What we've seen is a boom turning into a bust. Is it a recession? Is it not? Uh, don't get into the semantics. The key is that we have seen an inventory buildup across retail and manufacturing that we haven't seen in a very, very long time. In fact, it's the highest we've seen in about 20 years of PMI data. Manufacturers are saying their inventories have exploded. Of course, we've heard from retailers. They reported a month ago telling us inventories are up. I want to hear from some of these key manufacturers this week as they report what are they seeing in that channel because it could really be an indicator of what the third quarter is going to look like. That's what I'm most focused on for GDP, employment, and growth in profits. And I think inventories are going to give us that indication. And Jeffrey, I'm glad you touched on that. Dave was just talking about SNAP as a potential canary in the coal mine. And I noticed that 14 analysts downgraded the stock today. Are we finally getting that to that position in the earnings season when we can have those re-ratings to the downside? Yeah, boy, we really started to see those downward revisions pick up. Although it's really only a U.S. phenomenon so far. Right now, about 70% of the changes to earnings estimates by analysts are to the downside in the U.S. over the last rolling 30 days. But you know what? In Europe, in Asia, they're still on the upside. They're still seeing higher earnings estimates for a number of different reasons. The dollar is a factor there. Of course, the dollar acting as a drag on U.S. multinational profits. Uh, but as we look outside the U.S., dollar is actually a boost. Right. As they have sales in the U.S., they're actually translating back into more euros and more yen. So we're seeing a differential there. And that's interesting how that is shaping up uh, over the course of this week and next week as well, translating into real results. So then, Jeffrey, in terms of the earnings that we do have coming up this week, what are going to be the real bellwethers for you? Well, you know, I, so much of the market is focused on, you know, the, the Apples and the Amazons and, and Meta and, and those names. There's just so much of a focus on those that I think it is important and, and a bellwether of, of consumer demand and, and activity. But look, I'm still going back to those uh, industrial companies' earnings and what they're talking about when it comes to earnings because that many, I'm sorry, inventories, because that inventory then shows up in the retail channels. Uh, and across businesses. And that's really the leading indicator I'm most focused on. It's a key indicator of inflation also, by the way. We're now seeing all this backup in inventory. It means price cuts may be coming, and that could take some pressure off the Fed here. Of course, not for this week, 
but perhaps for September. Maybe I don't hear enough about the, the contributor that housing is to CPI, a full third of inflation. So let's see where those prices go. But I do have to ask you about our semantic debate of the day, which is the comments from Janet Yellen that we are not in a recession given the labor market it has to be more broad based than this. Where do you side on this? You know, I, I, when I like to look at uh, the the overall economy, I, I don't feel like we're maybe in one yet, but, you know, the, the jury's out on how much more downside pressure there is. Certainly, it's a bust of some form, and, and it's showing up in a number of different ways. But look, the stock market's already priced in, I would say, a mild recession with a relative performance of cyclicals lately. But look what's happening this month cyclicals are leading the recovery. I know you're not seeing it in tech today, but you are seeing it in energy. Uh, financials are doing well today, industrials. And that's been the story this, this month. We've seen 8 to 10% gains in cyclicals. Despite all this talk about recession, I think maybe that recession talk might have gone a little bit too far or maybe the emphasis on a deep recession rather than perhaps a passing or mild one. Well, I'm glad we're uh, concentrating on the right things here. Uh, we got time for one more. You mentioned the dollar before. I want to show a chart on the Wi-Fi Interactive. This is year to date. Huge move for the Dixie, heavily weighted against the euro. Euro's at parity. But when you take a look at the max chart here, we punched above these 2015 highs. And guess what? Those early highs from 2020, or excuse me, 20 years ago, those seem to be in play right now. I'm just wondering what a stronger dollar, massively stronger dollar looks like for the global economy. You know, it, it, it is a bit of a drag. It reflects tighter financial conditions, but I do believe the dollar peaks along with inflation. And so as we're getting close to that, I think we've already seen it in commodity prices. Perhaps we're seeing it, starting to see it in goods prices right now with services price, prices like housing and the like uh, following maybe in just a little bit. That means that maybe the dollar begins to take a break here and we finally get a little bit of an, an ease up in what has been a real challenge for a number of businesses around the world as they conduct uh, uh, sales in an environment of 10 to 15 percent uh, gains in the dollar this year, whether you're looking at euro or yen, it's been a big factor. Yeah, if the dollar breaks, I think a lot of investors and multinationals will get a break as well. Thank you, Jeffrey Kleintop. Always great to see you here. To the closing bell on this Thursday, July 21st, and we are getting that closing bell right now. You can see in the New York Stock Exchange, I believe it's Core and Maine, a company that distributes water, sewer, storm drain, and fire protection down in Wall Street, guys. That was a closing bell on Wall Street. Stocks looks like we're holding on to gains. The Dow closing up 162 points. S&P up just about 1%, just shy of that 4,000 mark. NASDAQ, the leader once again today. That's been the story all week with the Nasdaq closing up just about 1.3%. Taking a look at the sector action today, consumer discretionary, healthcare, materials, technology among the leaders, communication services, energy to the downside with energy off just about 2%. Well, for more on this, we want to bring in Kevin Mann, Hennian and Walsh Chief Investment Officer. And joining us from Boston, we have Ryan Bellinger. He's Clara Advisors founder and managing a principal. Kevin, first to you, because it's about the third or fourth day in a row where we've seen technology lead NASDAQ outperforming. What do you make of the buying action that we're seeing in the leadership from some of those large cap names that have been beaten down so far this if year? If you think about it, the names that have been hurt the most during this pullback in 2022 have been technology, consumer discretionary, notably e-commerce. Boy, did we get an announcement from a big e-commerce name this morning with Amazon's acquisition, spending $3.9 billion now to get into the healthcare space. I'm not gonna call the bottom here, but what I will suggest is that if in fact we've met the technical definition of recession, and I believe that we have, and recessions last on average 12 months, well, guess what? Typically, the stock market bottoms about four to six months prior to the end of a recession, which puts us right into that August-September time frame, which is when I think the Fed will turn less aggressive, and that should provide upside potential for stocks as well, including technology stocks. And Ryan, do you also believe that we're in a recession? And if so, how are you positioning your portfolio? What are you rotating in or out on? Yeah, certainly possible that we're in a recession. It's just hard to know. Oftentimes you look back and, and have those answers. But um, yeah, from the, the leading indicators that we look at, certainly a few of those are turning negative with manufacturing and new orders. Uh, consumer sentiment's a big one for us. I mean, it, you know, it kind of is self-perpetuating once people start to think we're in a recession, you, you kind of start to be in one. And um, so just to be defensive in portfolios, we're liking 
you know, the dividend paying stocks, uh, companies that are providing a tremendous amount of free cash flow. Uh, but we are also are not abandoning the large cap technology space. Um, I totally agree. I feel like there's some really good opportunities for investors with a, a longer term time frame to pick up some companies at great prices, uh, companies that people liked in the last couple of years. And uh, they're still making good products and have great technology. So just because the share price is down, that's actually the reason to buy. And so that's what we're telling our clients. Kevin, what are you seeing from the consumer? As a, I mean, We've talked about this self-fulfilling prophecy, so much talk about being in a recession or whether one's down, lying down the road. Yes. Are we talking ourselves into a recession? Well, there's a couple of traditional indicators that are flashing red, right? We, the yield curve is inverted right now. The yield curve has inverted before every recession in our country going back to 1955. And we also know that in all likelihood, we've now had two consecutive negative quarters of real GDP. But to your point, we also see the consumer still spending. We have an unemployment rate at 3.6% and retail sales still proves relatively strong, but there are dents in those armor as well. We saw initial jobless claims today, the fourth consecutive weekly uptick over 251,000. Our personal savings rate has now dipped to 4.4% and Americans are putting more on their credit cards than they ever have before. They're still spending, but they have to borrow from their savings, put it on credit cards to keep up with these inflated prices. How much longer can that last? And if they pull back on spending, well, 70% of our economic growth comes from consumers. Yeah. John Stanky this morning said that he's seeing people pay a little bit later their bills mm -hmm. each and every month. And that's why he expects a little bit of a waning economy down the road, just seeing little slippage here and there. Yes. Yeah, Ryan, we heard uh, Kevin saying that he expects maybe the Fed won't be as aggressive as some on the street are anticipating that we'll see at least into the fall. Do you agree with that? I think it's going to have to depend on the CPI prints. I mean, if these things keep coming in really hot, um, they don't really have a choice. I mean, this is their principal mandate at this point. Uh, they've got to get the, the inflation under control. And, and it's, statistically, they have to get the, the Fed funds rate at a level of, above future consensus inflation rates. So if we're going to settle in at 4% or so, I really feel like we got to get there on the federal funds rate. It's a little higher than the forecast is now. Um, certainly the data can change, but it feels to me like the Fed has, has got one clear goal. That's to stamp out inflation by raising interest rates. And so that's what we're thinking is probably going to happen. And Kevin, obviously, with every data point that we get in, we see the market sort of fluctuate, but they are. They do seem to be pricing in that 75 basis point hike. What are you doing? What are you concentrating on to really not focus on the noise, but really focus on what's going to give you a clear indication of where the markets could be headed in the next few months? Sure. And I do believe that the Fed will raise rates by 75 basis points next week. They don't meet in August. They come back in September. And at that point in time, they're going to see us that we're in a technical definition of recession. They see continued earnings deterioration. And I believe they turn less aggressive and perhaps only raise up to 3% by the end of this year. The economy can't withstand any more than that. And if, in fact, we are in a slowing economy, which I think we all agree that we are, one sector that we really like is health care. Two ways to access the health care sector, one through traditional large cap pharmaceutical companies like a Merck or a Bristol Myers Squibb. Another way is through the smaller cap biotech companies who are likely to be acquired by those large cap pharmaceutical companies with excess cash on their balance sheets. Names like Karuna Therapeutics or even Axum Therapeutics. We think the healthcare sector is certainly worthy of consideration in this environment. Ron, I want to kick, quickly get your take on the housing sector. We've seen a lot of down data this week. Existing home sales fall 5.4%. Home buyer sentiment plunged 12%. But yet we're stuck with this number, a median record price of north of $407,000 per home. Telling you what? Well, I think it's just, it's old news, to be honest. I think that number is coming down. It's probably going to come down quite quickly. Uh, rates are, are up significantly. That's slowing some of the home buying. Uh, so we would expect home prices to come down. One interesting thing to watch, I mean, housing is about 33% of the CPI number. Uh, and within the housing, home prices are about 80% and rents are about 20%. So it might be interesting to watch. You could have a scenario where home prices are coming down, that's actually going to pull down the CPI number, but a lot of people rent and rents are only going up. And so it could you could have a situation where things are actually tougher up there than what the CPI is is forecasting just due to that imbalance and how the, the housing is broken down in the CPI number. 
And guys, right now we're waiting for snap earnings. They're expected to be out any minute. It was a decent day for snap, but Kevin, year to date, the socks off just about 65%. A Ouch. lot of the focus is going to be snap. on advertising spend. <laughs> what are you looking for? Not so much in these sp specific results, but what we're seeing more broadly speaking in the social media space. Yeah, I, I think the theme for snap is still growing, but yet slowing. We're anticipating, I believe, earnings per share of around four cents. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe daily active users have gone up, but still at the slowest growth rate in over two years. Revenue should have increased, but at the slowest growth rate in over three years. And I think that's indicative right now of the social media space and ad sales in this environment. So it's one area that we're not particularly optimistic about. Snap doesn't meet our selection criteria within our portfolios, but beyond social media, we really like the e-commerce space and we think that has a lot of upside potential in the months and years ahead. Still growth, but slow in growth. Great to have you in studio, Kevin Mon. appreciate it. Thank you. Also, Ryan Bellinger with us today. Thank you both. Well, inflation is weighing on the minds of many Americans, but how willing are we to adjust our lifestyles in order to make ends meet? Well, in our recent Yahoo Finance Twitter poll, travel is far and away the thing people are willing to sacrifice, leading to almost 46% of the vote. Now, dining out follows over at over 34%, streaming at 13.7%, and self-care coming in last at under 7%, people not willing to give that up. But inflation is, of course, impacting all Americans. But from boomers to Gen Z, to what degree does it affect each generation. Well, for more, we turn to our next guest, Country Financial Director of Wealth Management and Financial Planning, Chelsea Moore. Thank you so much for joining us. So obviously, with inflation at a 40-year high, you have an entire generation who's, who's never experienced these levels of inflation. Start off by telling us how this is mostly affecting Gen Z. Sure. Great question. Um, what I think is interesting looking at the different generations is that as you go down in generations from boomers all the way to Gen Z, each generation feels a little less secure than the next one. And that's not necessarily a huge surprise, right? When you take into account that baby boomers and Gen X have saved a little bit more than millennials and Gen Z simply because they have more working years under their belt. How, though, are you seeing a difference just in terms of how people are preparing for a potential downturn? Yeah, I, I think what's interesting is looking at the data in 2020 and 2021, what we saw over those two years is that we saw excess savings. So this meant that consumers were able to create a nice savings cushion. However, our recent survey data found that more than half of the respondents were not willing to make a lifestyle sacrifice in the event of a recession. So things like streaming, dining out, entertainment, or pampering themselves. And so what we're seeing data so far this year is that consumers are no longer saving. They're actually starting to draw down those savings. And as that cushion starts to dwindle, and, and if we see inflation stay elevated, consumers' behavior is going to have to adjust. They're either needing or going to have to cut the spending or rely on debt like credit card to fund those purchases. And you're right, baby boomers are much more likely to feel secure than younger generations because of that time um, that they've had to build the retirement savings, invest them, and pay down their debt. Interesting to see all these businesses preparing for the potential recession and consumers not following their lead. An interesting number out today, 40% of workers are considering quitting their jobs in the next 12 months. That's on the heels of record after record after record of the great resignation. What do you make of the fact that in the face of all the things we've discussed, almost half of the country is still considering leaving a job? Well, what I think is interesting is specifically looking at the millennials. Um, right now, they're in those prime spending years. So they're a large percentage of the population. And right now, they're starting families, purchasing homes, and they're trying to grow in their careers. So a lot of that big part is millennials looking for additional jobs. And with the big shift to remote, it just opens up so many more opportunities. And we're seeing in that same study that the debt to income ratio of Americans born in the 1980s is higher than any other birth group. So whether you're Gen Z, a millennial, Gen X, baby boomer, what should be your priority in getting your financial picture together in this sort of environment? Yeah, I think the first thing is to just work with someone that you know and trust. There are many firms out there that have done research on the value of advice. 
So working with someone you know and trust can really make that big difference in reaching your investment goals like retirement. The second one is just having a plan and staying on course. Times like this, it makes us have a really bad gut reaction and feel like we have to do something. Um, but really the, the three biggest ways that you can make a change is save more, spend less, or change your goal like retire later. All right, Country Financial Director of Wealth at Wealth Management and Financial Planning, Chelsea Moore, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brian Sazi in D.C. at the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Summit. And I have a very special guest here, Goldman Sachs Chairman and CEO, David Solomon. Good to see you. Good to see you. Didn't I just see you on an earnings call? Uh, you did see him on an earnings call yesterday. <laughs> All right. Well, you didn't, you didn't see me. You heard me. I heard you. Well, I'll take that as well. So uh, really, the, the room is, is getting filled out here in D.C. A lot of small business owners, lots of things top of mind with them. I, I talked to one individual uh, that is, was concerned about how to fire an employee. Another one is worried about inflation. What do you think the biggest challenges of, of small businesses are right now? Well, small businesses have had big headwinds over the course of the last couple of years. The pandemic was, was very, very tough on small businesses. Um, but I will say one of the reasons we've brought all these small businesses together is to give them an opportunity both to interact with each other, share experiences learned, but also to talk to their legislators about the support they need so that they can move their businesses forward. Small businesses are such an important part of the lifeblood of the American economy. Huge hires, huge employers. There's no question, and we've been surveying them, that they're concerned about the chance of a recession, but they're also optimistic, and they're also looking for ways to continue to move forward. And I think there's some great messages while we're here in Washington about making sure we get appropriate access to credit and appropriate support to small businesses so they can continue to invest and continue to grow such a vibrant part of the U.S. economy. You're right. Uh, small business is very much the, the engine of this economy. Are they hunkering down? Well, hunkering down, um, I, I think it's a little bit too big a generalization to say that all small businesses are hunkering down. I'd say all businesses, large and small, are being more cautious right now. There's more uncertainty around the economic trajectory of the country. Inflation is a big, big headwind, and it's a very, very tough headwind on small businesses. And so I think people are operating more cautiously, but I think people are watching, trying to figure out the trajectory of travel. Uh, people are investing in their businesses, trying to move forward, but I think with a little bit more caution. I listened to your earnings call three times. That's just what I do. I, I had to do it. And you, I, you, we have to find something better for you to do well, because yeah, three well, times. Yeah, I mean, well, that's, get in know, line, David Solomon. You know, maybe, a lot of people maybe, tell maybe, me that. Maybe a Netflix show yeah, well, or something right, fair after the first or second Fair time. enough. Okay. But I heard, I heard more caution in your voice than I heard three months ago. What made you say that? Well, I, I, um, I think there is caution in my voice. Um, I, I don't know on a relative basis to three months ago. I'd say three months ago I was pretty cautious too. <laughs> We, we've had a bunch that's happened over the last six to, you know, six to nine months as we ex exit the pandemic and we're starting to move forward. Obviously, the war in Ukraine was a big disruptor, but I've really seen, watched, and experienced through the eyes of our clients the growing imprint of inflation on the economic activity around the world, and it's a big headwind. And so, I think that headwind creates caution. I think the path is uncertain. There are a lot of people speculating about an, a recession. There are a lot of people speculating about the trajectory of all this. What I'd say is I'm uncertain as to the trajectory of it all, but I know that the scenarios where we have a bumpy road ahead are certainly possible, and I think it's a time to be a little bit more cautious and really kind of tighten up and make sure that you're deploying your assets and your resources in places where they're very, very prudent decisions. When does this, these double-digit gains. We're seeing inflation for, for many different items. When does that slow? Well, it takes a while. Inflation is, 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 is a hard thing to crack. I think the Fed's on it. They're starting to tighten monetary conditions. I think slowly we're starting to get some improvement in supply chains, but I think that's going to take some time. And so we've had a variety of real exogenous events from the pandemic and otherwise, the war, that have really kind of accelerated the inflationary environment. And it's going to take us a while, you know, to get some real relief. But I'm hopeful that as we head through the rest of the year and into next year, we'll see a flattening out and ultimately a decline in inflation so we can get back to a more normal operating environment. Has inflation become a trend, entrenched? Well, I think right now, and I said this yesterday in my earnings call, that inflation is deeply entrenched. But that doesn't mean that we can't, through appropriate monetary actions, different policy actions, get back to a better place where things are more in balance. 
Um, but at the moment, inflation is a big issue, and it's having a big economic impact on everyone. Um, and in particular, it affects small businesses. It affects individuals across our country. And so we've got to really make sure we make the right policy decisions here to try to alleviate this economic headwind. Is the right policy decision for the Fed, is that a 100 basis point move at their next meeting? I, I won't speculate or, or predict a specific move, but economic conditions need to get tighter to break the back of inflation. Um, and I think the Fed's focused on it, and they're moving in a direction, and hopefully we'll start to see you know, some balance in all of this as they move in that direction. As we move to that, that tightening economic uh, climate or backdrop from the Fed, do you see more market volatility? Um, I do see a little bit more market volatility, but I think the volatility, I think at this point the market is expecting you know, more aggressive tightening on the part of the Fed. I think where we have some volatility or softness in the market as we look forward is I think you've got to watch corporate earnings. And up to this point, corporate earnings have hung in reasonably well. But with a tightening economic environment, I think you're going to see more pressure on corporate earnings. And it's just math. If we kept the same earnings multiple on the S&P, but corporate earnings decreased by 10 percent, you can figure out what the market impact is. So I think the big thing to watch in the next 12 months is corporate earnings. If you're a student of history, any time we've been in this kind of environment, a decline in corporate earnings lags and comes next. And that should put, that, that may put, that should, that may put a little bit more pressure on, uh, on stock markets. When I'm not listening to your earnings calls three times, uh, I'm reading all the economic research from your team, specifically Jan Hatzius. I believe he's at a 40% chance of a recession next year. Are well, you, you on board with that? Jan is, Jan is um, Jan I think is the best out there. He's, he's you know, an incredible economist. And his prediction, I believe, is a 30% chance 30%. of a recession this year, this year. Um, or in the next 12 months and a 50% chance of a recession in the next 24 months. And so, you know, it's, it's a data point. He's in the business of making predictions. I'm not in the business of making predictions. So we'll watch and see. How do you plan to run Goldman Sachs differently into this tightening economic climate? Well, we don't run Goldman Sachs differently. And I've been around in the business watching these economic scenarios for almost 40 years. I graduated from college in the early 80s, the last time we were coming out of a high inflation environment. We always run Goldman Sachs with a focus on our clients, trying to make sure we're getting our resources, our people, our capital, our financial resources directed at our clients. In an environment like this, we probably have to be a little bit more cautious with respect to the way we invest in the future and growing the franchise, but we always take a long-term view. We try to be very, very nimble and flexible. I think this, this environment demands that. And we'll stay focused on our clients. And we know if we do that, we do the right thing. We may see our business slow a little bit, but in the long run, we'll continue to perform. Um, and, uh, and that's where our focus is right now. Do you see a spillover? So the economic climate overseas in Europe has really also taken a, a turn for the worst. Do you think that spills over to the US? Well, it's something I think you have to, you have to think about. I think the chance of a recession in Europe is certainly higher, mm -hmm. given what's going on there economically and some of the policy decisions that have been made across the continent over the course of the last five to 10 years. A recession in Europe potentially knocks one percentage point off U.S. growth. And so we are globally connected. We do operate in a global ecosystem economically. And a slowdown in Europe will have an impact on the United States. That's something that I think our economists like Jan factor in you know, to their calculus when they're predicting the forward. Maybe you could clear this up for us. I've seen clear this up for us. I've seen some stories since the earnings report on, on hiring. Is there a hiring freeze at Goldman? There is not a hiring freeze at Goldman. Okay. And I, you know, just to, to be candid, I was disappointed. I went back and you said you listened to the earnings, the earnings call three times. Mm -hmm. I went back and listened to it a first time. <laughs> I participated the first time. But I listened to it. Dennis Coleman, our CEO, you know, appropriately said we're looking at all our resources around the firm, you know, financial and otherwise, and we are slowing the pace of our hiring. So we've grown the firm enormously over the course of the last few years. We've done a significant amount of hiring. We had planned to do meaningful hiring in the back half of the year, and we're slowing it down, but we haven't frozen it. There's certainly places where we're investing, and we'll continue to make those investments. Um, and he also mentioned that we have a performance evaluation process that we do every year at the end of the year. We skipped it in 2021 coming out of the pandemic, but we're always looking at, you know, the, uh, the, the, the overall headcount of the firm, and we usually call a few percent of the firm every year. That's been something we do 
and we've done, you know, the 20 some odd years I've been at the firm, we've always done that, and so we're going back to that. But there is no hiring freeze, but we're going to be more prudent and slow down our growth in this environment. So you're bringing back that annual performance review. What do you think the, the results of that will be? Another, what, calling a percentage of the workforce? We, we've always, it's, it's one of the things that's important to understand about Goldman Sachs and the way you know, we operate. It's a very performance-based culture. We're always looking to make sure that people that aren't performing in our organization don't hang around because it prevents us from giving the opportunity to hire more people that can really perform and add. Remember, it's a, it's a professional services firm. It's a people organization. We just are starting this week 3,500 new analysts who are just out of undergraduate school, over 300,000 wow, people. Wow, I feel old. Apply, well, you know, I am old. <laughs> you might feel old, but I am old. Over 300,000 people applied for those jobs. And so we have this great talent ecosystem, and we always want to make sure we're making room for young, excited, energized talent, you know, to come into the firm. Oh. And so that's, that's, that's something we've always done. It's a return to normalcy for Goldman Sachs. As a former analyst myself and in the spirit of analysts, let me ask you two questions in one. Checking accounts, back half of the year, still rolling out? Yes, that is our plan. Okay, checking accounts. And then lastly, your 2024 targets that you put out Investor Day, February, still on track. Yes, and you heard me, since you listened to the earnings call three times, I said, I think, twice in the earnings call, once in my script and once in a question, there's nothing about this environment that's changing our strategic plan for Goldman Sachs. We are continuing to invest in our core businesses, strengthen and grow these new platforms, which include transaction banking, asset management, wealth management, and our digital consumer bank, because we really think there's opportunity for us to diversify our revenue streams, have more fee income, more stable, predictable revenue base for the firm, and we think that will accrue in value to our shareholders. And so we're comfortable with those targets, they're three-year targets, a lot of time between now and 2024, and you know we don't manage the firm on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis, but we feel very good about the strategy we've been put in place, and we're going to continue to execute on it. Any Netflix suggestions for me? Um, I, um, I, was, um, I was told, I don't know what's Netflix and what's not, but the two things that, um, you know, I've got, a long, uh, I've got a long trip, I'm going to Tokyo next week, um, and the two things that I was told to watch is one is called The Offer, which I think is about the making of The Godfather, okay. and the other is called Severance. Um, and, uh, and so those are the next two things on my, uh, my streaming list when I get around to it. But I will I'm a, give you a I'm a slow streamer. Uh Of course, red-hot inflation is putting markets on edge and triggering fears of a recession. The causes behind the price hikes include the war in Ukraine, record government spending packages. One investor is arguing there is perhaps one more factor to blame. Millennials, not just that, but the size of the millennial cohort. That's where we find Sazi's take today. Saz? All right, thanks so much. Okay, Julie, this is a very special take where I want to bring in Bill Smead, Smead Capital Management, CIO and co-portfolio manager, who talked about this uh, in a recent interview. Bill, uh, good to see you here this morning. Thanks for hopping on. I understand there's been a challenging, I would say, 48 hours for you. This situation really blew up on Twitter. So let me get, let me swap the deck here. Are, are you saying that millennials are to blame for this type of inflation we're seeing? No. Uh, that that was a headline written by someone else. I, I, never, I never put the word blame in the piece that I wrote or the conversation that I had. So here, here's what's going on. Uh, back when I was in the uh, 22 to 40 year old age range as a baby boomer, there was 75 percent more baby boomers than there was the generation in front of us. So when 75 percent more people got into the household formation, home buying, car buying part of their life, I call it the necessity spending part of your life. There were too many people with too much money. Uh, left over from the Vietnam War and, and Johnson's Great Society. And then we had an oil embargo in 1973, and it just triggered things like a wildfire. We call it Wolverine inflation. So 75% more people in the key necessity spending age group uh, with massive liquidity in front of them uh, created quite an inflation binge. So it's the def demographic differential. It's not the humans. It's not what they're doing. It's not the choices they're making that's causing inflation. It is just the sheer size of the group. There are 41.5% more millennials than there are Gen Xers. Therefore, there's 41% more people that want to buy houses and buy cars and, and, and buy the necessities that they need. And we got flooded with liquidity and had a 
uh, you know, Arab uh, torpedoed the oil industry in April of 2020, and you set up the same kind of circumstances that we had in the 1970s. The difference this time, though, it's 41.5% more people in the key necessity buying area rather than 75% more like it was in the 1970s. So, Bill, how should we kind of warp or change our expectations around what for millennials and what for generations, regardless of how large their cohort is, what their expectations for wages should be, and then that combating inflation so that they can still have equity in homes, so that they can still have family formation and all of the things that generations prior were also afforded? So... It's an interesting group of people because they waited five to seven years later in life, uh, you know, to get married and have kids. Out so, of necessity as well, uh, though, right? And, and buy homes, right, and cars. If you lived in a major metropolitan city and worked, you took public transportation and Uber. You didn't buy a car. So, so the, the, the fact of the matter is this group is the most college-educated group. By the way, just so you know, we're very positive about the economy of the United States the next 10 years. But we also expect a, 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 an elongated period of higher inflation, uh, n not 9 percent, but certainly we could see 5 percent inflation in the next 10 years because we're, we're bullish on the way that those demographics favor economic activity. Do not worry about the wages. I, I everywhere I go, uh, you know, in and out and. Chick-fil-A and these people are offering $17 an hour to go to work. Wages at the low end are rising fast. You need to worry about uh, uh, the people in the tech world. We got way too many coders, way too many tech people. We mass-produced technology workers for, you know, 15 years, and there's a slowdown in technology spending going on. So, so the, the irony is we're very positive ab about the economy the next 10 years, but history would show that that positive economics uh, w will translate to lower price earnings ratios in the stock market b because interest rates have to go quite a bit higher in relation to, let's say, uh, inflation that averages 5 percent the next 10 years. And, and Bill, this goes back to something we were discussing earlier in the show, which is a, a call out from Goldman Sachs that we are going to see slowing job growth and that we could see, as of 2024, an unemployment rate back up to 4 percent. So with that kind of an economic scenario like you're describing, which is you're saying fairly strong earnings growth, but lower multiples and perhaps uh, lower job growth. I mean, what does that all spell in terms of what investors should be looking at right now? That lower job growth would only be in the short run as a consequence of the slowdown that the Fed's tightening would create. That, that, that's not a natural consequence of where we are in the, in the timeline. That's just a function of the Fed tightening credit. So they first got to knock that 9% down to 5%, right? That's what's going to slow the job growth. But if you're a cook or a talented weight person or a talented greeter, I mean, they're paying through the nose right now. Uh, they'll, they'll beg you to come and cook at Applebee's or Red Robin or wherever it is. This is the best time to, to be in, in that industry with skills you've ever ever thought of. And, and, and so, no, I, I, in, the, in the 70s, we had high inflation, high interest rates, a terrible stock market. And we built more houses per population in that decade, any decade of my lifetime. And, and we believe that we're going to build more houses in the next 10 years per population than we've built for 20 or 30 years because these people need a home. Now, what that's going to cause is spreading people out across the geography, right? The, the, the millennials are going to buy houses in places that are more affordable, and that's where we need to build the houses. Bill, we've talked to you uh, for many years, and you've been at this game for a while. Just curious on what the past 48 hours have been like for you, a veteran of the financial services industry, to essentially go viral off a story like this. I, I, I don't think people even watched the video, the, the interview that I did, because they, they, they didn't under, all, all they knew was the title, right? That whoever put the title and said that I blame the millennials, that's what made it go viral. Nothing that we've written or said. Everyone know, knows me as the guy that's super bullish. I have five millennial children, and, and uh, no, no one's more bullish economically over the next 10 years on millennials than I am.
All right, Bill Smead, setting the record straight. Bill, always good to talk with you. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Concerns of a recession are looming over investors as the Atlanta Fed now estimates Q2 GDP will contract by about 1.5%. That's negative 1.5% is what they're projecting there. Plus, over the weekend, a Moody's analyst said that they are hearing more recession talk than ever before. For more, we welcome in City Global Wealth Head of North American Investments, Kristen Bitterly. Thanks so much for joining us this morning, Kristen. Uh, the likelihood of a recession at a time of employment growth in the data as well right now, should we expect just a technical recession based on GDP contraction or a real recession with wider ranging implications? So I, I think the question of, of a technical recession versus a real recession, we all know and we're all learning and reminding ourselves of what actually constitutes a recession in terms of the depth, the diffusion, um, in, in terms of real contraction of economic activity. We certainly aren't there yet. So if we see a technical one, that could certainly happen. But I think the bigger question right now is really the, the balance of the Fed's trajectory and what they continue to do, as well as the strength of the consumer. Those are the two things that we're really going to be balancing out. And unfortunately, in terms of the data, and you mentioned this earlier in the program, the Fed is paying attention to trends. They're not going to look at singular data points. And so to really have clarity as to whether we tip over into a recession, and we would see that out in 2023, we're going to need to wait for the next couple of months. Kristen, uh, the, the reads on inflation that we have gotten have been, and they have continued to be shocking. You don't think that warrants a, a more aggressive pace of tightening from the Fed? I think it's going to keep the Fed on the trajectory that it's currently at, right? So in terms of 75 basis points, clearly on the table, and that is our base case. We're seeing some abatement, obviously, in terms of whether it's gas prices, whether it's the commodity sector. I think the tricky part within inflation right now is really the owner's equivalent rents and looking at overall shelter costs. That's a, a part of the equation that has a lag and does have some stickiness to it. So the Fed has to really thread this needle in terms of determining what they have control over, what they don't have control over, and whether the medicine that they're providing is really the appropriate cure for the illness that the economy is currently experiencing. So, Kristen, whether they raise 75 basis points, whether they raise 100 basis points, what they continue to do this year, are you as sort of glued to those small signals that they tend to give in their statements and to how much they're raising? Or do you think that are you and do you think investors should be more focused on just the general trajectory that rates are going up? I think that investors, you almost have to say, how do I prepare my portfolio for what could occur from here? So when we look at the percentage probabilities of whether we're going to tip over into a recession or whether we're just going to see the slowing growth environment, we give the slight edge to the slowing growth environment simply because of the strength of the consumer coming into this. But how do you prepare your portfolio for both of those situations? And it's actually creating some strong diversification within the portfolio across both fixed income and equity and really leaning into quality and being relatively conservative when it comes to either stretching for yield or extending yourself when it comes to credit. So I think there is a portfolio solution here as an investor to remain fully invested, but ensuring that you have raised quality across both equities and fixed income. We've already started to get some earnings out with banks really kicking things off and a few airlines as well. What types of either guidance, forecast revisions might you be looking out for even as we move on throughout the rest of this earnings season? Yeah, so as we're looking at earnings, I mean, our, our expectations are roughly in line with, with analysts that we, we see around 4.6%. I think the one thing, though, to look through to in terms of earnings is when you strip out the energy component of that and the energy sector, you're actually looking at negative earnings growth. And so a lot of this has really been priced into the market overall. We certainly have seen that in terms of certain sectors and the expectations coming into earnings season. I think it's kind of looking out into the second half of the year and the forward guidance is what's gonna be most critical. And again, it all points back to consumer because the consumer is 65 to 70% consumer spending is, is that percentage of GDP. And also looking at what constitutes durable demand. This is the key question across all sectors. Understanding that if consumers are making those decisions in terms of their spending and recognizing that real wages have actually declined. Where are they spending? How are they spending? And what is that forward guidance for the second half of the year? 
All right, well put. City Global Wealth Head of North American Investments, Kristen Bitterly. Always good to see you. We'll talk to you soon. Good to see you too. Well, the inflation story is so prevalent, it's become a meme born out of a TikTok trend. We're paying more for everything from the gas pump to the grocery store and everywhere along the way. It takes the ultimate optimist to find some good news in the latest report, but we couldn't find one. So instead, we tapped senior columnist Rick Newman to go out and find some. What'd you find, Rick? That's more like it, Dave. You called me Mr. Sunshine once and I almost had a heart attack. Uh, so, I mean, the reason that I'm um, trying to spin it this way is because I've been tracking uh, a bunch of consumer categories in the uh, inflation picture uh, since uh, way back into last year and noticing a lot of changes. And that there actually were some important changes in the, in the numbers we got earlier this week. So, uh, in a, a, few, a few categories, most notably new cars, used cars, rental cars and transportation overall, we've seen a huge decline in the rate of inflation. If, if you remember back to uh, January and February this year, uh, used car inflation was 40% or higher. And no, I mean, we've never seen that before. That, that was just wackadoodle. And used car inflation, uh, this, the, this has come down to the seven to 10% range. Uh, new cars, we're still seeing high inflation there, but it's not what it used to be. And what this tells us is that the supply chain issues that were causing a shortage of these products in the first place, that we're working these things out. So um, that's actually good news. Now, um, there are other categories where inflation is getting worse, not better. The most obvious one is gasoline, 60% increase year over year in the latest numbers. Uh, but there are a couple other ones there that are really important to pay attention to. Gasoline gets all the attention, uh, but household energy is up by more than 20% year over year. And uh, the typical household spends more on heating and cooling their home and hot water than they do on gasoline. So household energy, that's going the wrong direction. Uh, and then just housing costs overall, they are up by about 7%. Uh, that is lower than the overall rate of inflation, now 9.1%. But Americans spend a third of their uh, budget on housing. So those are the uh, things that are going in the wrong direction. So it's a mixed picture. There's a lot of bad news, but there's some not so bad news. And so, Rick, how much of that is about demand destruction? People perhaps giving up on trying to get a new car, given how much some of these monthly rates are and just how expensive cars are, are overall right now? Well, there's no simple category that says uh, this amount of inflation or declining inflation is due to demand destruction. And there's also the question of um, what's the difference between destruction and deferral? So uh, there is demand destruction um, happening with regard to things like gasoline. I mean, if you combine two trips into one today, uh, that's gasoline. That's some gasoline you're not you're not purchasing and you are never going to purchase. But if you think that a car is too expensive right now and you want to wait six months or a year, that is deferred consumption. And that's actually I mean, th these are all actually good things. I mean, consumers do have choices. We are not automatons. Uh, who just go out and spend the same amount or buy the same amount of stuff no matter what the price is. We make rational decisions. And that's one of the things uh, that probably will bring the inflation rate uh, down during the next few months. Now, I was wrong. I thought inflation had peaked a couple of months ago when it hit 8.3%. And I was wrong about that. It went up to 8.6% and then uh, now up to 9.1% still. I think we may be at the top now and there are reasons to think we're not going to see inflation back to 4% uh, by the end of this year, but we could see it under uh, 8%. Rick, the Biden administration should listen to you because you just listed out a number of things in that inflation report that were actually pretty good. We, I, I haven't seen the Biden administration change the messaging like that. Am I missing something or why aren't they latching on to the good parts of this report? Well, you, you should you should call them up and tell them they need to start uh, reading my columns and passing them around I will. I them will. in the presidential daily briefing. <laughs> uh, but the, the White House has a they've been focusing on a different message or spin, if you prefer this. Uh, this week. So they they knew, like a lot of economists, that this number was going to be hot. And they were actually doing briefings beforehand. Now, they said, we don't yet know what the inflation number is. But they were trying to point out that the energy prices that go into these June, the, the June inflation numbers, these are actually, this is actually old data. And uh, and they're, they're right about this. I mean, the gas prices have actually fallen by uh, almost 40 cents, I think, at this point uh, per gallon since June. So um, gasoline prices peaked at $5.02 in 
in the middle of June, and that's right around the time that the government was gathering the inflation data. Uh, gas prices now, as you can see there, down 40 cents to about 460. And we know from the um, price of wholesale gasoline, which continues to go down, that uh, we're going to see lower gas prices still because it takes a few weeks to get that uh, transfer from the wholesale level to the retail level. So that's what the Biden administration was, fo was focusing on this week. And I think the reason is they're just obsessed with gasoline prices because Biden's the first president who ever had to explain gas prices that started with a five uh, on average. And uh, he needs to get them down to prices that start with a three on average. And we're not quite halfway there. So there's a long way to go. Yeah, it's an issue that a lot of voters focus on. Rick Newman, great to see you. Thanks so much for Hi, joining us. Again, we were just talking about the PPI and just kind of the inflationary story. To Akiko's question, do you see any signs in the PPI and the CPI, despite the strong headline number, of perhaps a better story on inflation for July, August, maybe later on? Thanks for having me on, and I do. I'd like to pick up on a point that you two just made. The data is somewhat backward looking. That's actually a critical point. The reason markets are worried is because the Fed now is very focused on headline inflation, even though it's backward looking. Fed Chair Powell recently said, this is not a time for a lot of nuances about headline and core. And so the concern is that with high headline inflation, potentially weakening economic growth momentum in a very aggressive Fed on rate hikes, um, a lot of concerns about the business cycle rolling over in an eventual recession are out there. So that's hitting markets hard. But let's look at the front edge of the inflation trade. It is collapsing. The dollar is up 15% year to date. Copper is down more than 30%. Broadly, metals are down almost 30% forward-looking bond market inflation expectations, and this is good news, are down sharply, well over 100 basis points. So that's actually helping the Fed tighten. If the Fed is lifting the nominal policy rate against the backdrop of falling long-term inflation expectations, then the real policy rate deflated by expected inflation is moving up uh, quite rapidly. And so we have tightening monetary and financial conditions that will help to bring inflation down. It will also slow growth. So we're going to have those recession concerns that are lingering. But I think that that really is a critical point. The data is backward looking. We're going to get some better news on headline inflation in the back half. So, Michael, let's talk about what we have seen over the last few weeks, which doesn't necessarily is not necessarily reflected in the data. We we're talking about commodity prices coming down. Obviously, energy has been a big, big part of uh, the spike we've seen in inflation. We're looking at some food costs coming down as well. I mean, how do you look at that data right now in the context of the bigger picture? And what does that tell us about where we are, you know, whether, in fact, we're close to the peak? Yeah, I think we are very close to the peak. I mean, this very well may have been it this past month. And in my view, I mean, I was quite worried about inflation and quite worried about the Fed being behind the curve. I mean, the last few times I was on the show, we talked a lot about that. Uh, but we change our view when the facts change. And if we look at these sensitive forward looking indicators, they're telling us that the Fed is rapidly catching up, that monetary conditions are tightening. Growth will slow, nominal demand growth will slow with the lag, and inflation will slow with the double lag. It is a lagging indicator. But on the headline inflation, I think we're going to get some better news very soon uh, because of these falling energy and food prices now, very important. The strong dollar, inflation expectations coming down. That's actually a very good story that the Fed's medicine is starting to work. Now, we can talk about recession risks, uh, but the first step in terms of dealing with uh, an inflation overshoot and being behind the curve is catching up, and they're they're effectively doing that now. How about the risk of the recession being induced by uh, too rapid of a Fed tightening when you consider markets kind of pricing in that the Fed is more likely than not to do that one percentage point uh, rate increase at the end of this month? You have Chris Waller, the Fed governor, the most significant member so far, saying he still expects 75 basis points, but it depends on incoming data, retail sales, and housing going to be the key there. You think that's the right stance? Yeah, I think certainly the business cycle risks rise when the Fed is moving rapidly to catch up. It's why you, you know, don't want to fall behind the curve to begin with, uh, because catching up means that you know there's a greater risk of going too far and then and then having a recessionary outcome. 
Uh, but that's where we are. Um, I think it would be better if the Fed were more focused on some sensitive forward-looking indicators like those bond market inflation expectations from the TIPS market. That's telling us that you know what they're doing is working, they're getting traction, and so we don't necessarily need panicky rate rises way beyond what the market expects from here. Um, if they do do 75 or 100, I think you know, there's probably going to be a strong case for slowing it down or even pausing after that. Um, policy does work with a lag in the forward looking sensitive market. They're telling us the conditions are tightening pretty sharply here. So it's a bit of a dicey situation. I would note this parts of the yield curve are inverting now that's creating consternation. The T bill yield is still below the rest of the coupon curve, but it, it really is narrowing pretty rapidly. So that will be something to watch for if the Fed goes 75 or 100. Uh, we'll probably have a pretty flat T-bill to coupon curve. If that goes inverted, then I, I think the recessionary risks are pretty dramatically amplified. more economic data coming out today. Yesterday, we were talking about CPI, more inflation data today, producer price index. This is obviously a good gauge of wholesale and business prices. PPI for final demand jumping 11% year on year in June, but 90% of that came from a jump in prices for final energy demand, which by the way, was up 10% in the month. Here's one thing though, and I'd be curious to get your take, Brian. You strip out food and energy, if you're talking about core PPI, it did decelerate just slightly. Yeah. So yes, just slightly, a 0.3% increase month on month versus other you know, estimates that we're expecting a little more. This comes against the backdrop of commodity prices starting to pull back a little, right? We've been talking about gas prices, oil prices, um, but also food, raw materials. I mean, again, you don't wanna make too much of one data set, but that does sort of raise the question, are we starting to see a slowdown a bit? Yeah, well, and I think that for what it's worth, we just need a baseline here because a lot of our viewers are probably like, I, I thought we all, I thought we got inflation data already. It's not Groundhog Day. We got CPI, the Consumer Price Index, yesterday, and then today we got the Producer Price Index. And the big differentiator between those two things is that the Consumer Price Index is what the consumer pays, as the name implies, whereas businesses. this is what the business expenses and kind of and all the, the cost of it. Right, exactly, and the difference there. So that might explain why this number is a little bit higher, because when you think about, for example, healthcare costs, well, the consumer that's getting the health uh, you know, care being provided is having the insurance absorb a lot of the cost, right? That explains some of the gap between CPI and PPI, not all of it, but it's gasoline, as you mentioned, that's really the big thing there. 18.5% increase in this particular report. If you strip that out, the core number looks okay. But again, thematically, we've been talking about this for all the inflation reports. That's not a satisfactory lens by which to view these reports from the average American standpoint, because a lot of the expenditures that they have is what they're pumping into their cars on a weekly basis to get to their jobs or to get from place uh, you know, to the grocery store. So really, at the end of the day, those types of things haven't alleviated or changed the overall narrative, which is that there is still a lot of inflation that's out there right now. Fed's not satisfied with that. That's why you have Fed Governor Chris Waller right, saying right now, well, he supports the less aggressive after yesterday's report, 75 basis point move. But depending on retail sales and housing data, mm -hmm. those are going to be two critical reports. He could be swayed perhaps to the one percentage point increase. Yeah, although I guess you could argue that, yes, you know, maybe things haven't, you know, they haven't peaked. We can't call the peak just yet. But but the, the data that we get now is backwards looking. And so, you know, the fact that we saw some deceleration there, is there a sign of more that's happening now that can point to a bit of a slowdown, at least in the rate of increases we've seen in costs. Consumer prices rising at the fastest pace since 1981 last month, a headline increase of 9.1%. If you back out food and energy, still an increase of 5.9%. Any way you slice it, people paying a lot more for a lot more stuff. We're joined now by Brian Deese, White House Director of the National Economic Council. Brian, thank you so much for being here. I want to start on those energy prices because I know that's something that you at the White House have pointed to as now a source of some relief. That's something we've been talking about as well. The prices of the pump have come down, but energy prices are volatile. So there's no guarantee they're going to stay down. So how do you address that issue? Well, thanks for having me. I think first, 
you are right that these numbers that came out today are outdated in the sense that they uh, don't reflect the significant decline in uh, oil prices and gas prices that we've seen. Gas prices at the pump down 30 days straight, down about 40 cents. Uh, so this number that came out today, about half of it is driven by uh, energy. Uh, that is outdated. Uh, but that's also why economists tend to look at what is referred to as core, which strips out energy and food. That number, as you say, 5.9% now down below 6%, but still too high. So I think the most important takeaway from this is that we need to keep acting urgently to uh, bring prices down. It's why here at the White House we're so focused on trying to urge Congress to act on legislation that would bring down costs for consumers on things like prescription drugs on things like semiconductors that go into almost every uh, durable good produced here in the country, uh, but also reduce the federal deficit, which would help to uh, provide a complement to what the Fed is doing on monetary policy. All those things are within our sights, within our reach. We could get those things done. I think this report underscores the urgency of moving on those measures this month. Brian, let's come back to energy for a moment, because yes, all of those things are obviously important input costs. Yes, economists look at core consumers, Look at the pump, right? They look at what they are putting into their vehicles, and that definitely informs consumer confidence and informs things like polls, of course, as well. Um, of course, the president is going to be heading to Saudi Arabia to try to get some relief on um, production from there. But talk to me about more about the White House's plan on the energy front. Absolutely. And you're right that uh, consumers feel it when they drive at the pump. That's why this decline for the past 30 days is so important. Prices are coming down. They're down 40%, 40 cents nationwide. There's about 10,000 gas stations around the country where gas is now under $4 a gallon. And importantly, if you look at where oil prices are now, while gas prices have come down about 8% from their peak, oil prices are down about 20%. So that means that there is more room for gas prices to come down. They should come down uh, as quickly as possible. And markets, at least, are signaling that they will continue to come down. That's important good news for consumers that, as you say, are filling up their uh, gas tanks every day. From our perspective, we're focused on doing what we can to keep that dynamic going. That's about increasing global supply. That's what the president was focused on with the G7 in trying to work toward what we refer to as a price cap on Russian oil. That would maintain stability in the global supply of oil while really focusing the economic pain on Vladimir Putin. That's why we're focused on releasing a million barrels a day from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which we have seen has had an impact on helping blunt the run-up in oil prices, and why the president has called for Congress to move beyond that act to provide a short-term elimination of the gas tax holiday. These are all things we're focused on, we're moving on, but it, the goal is to try to keep that momentum going. Because as you say, a lot of things are important, but the fact that gas prices have now come down 30 days in a row, that is important for a lot of people across this country. Brian, indeed it is, and I hear your point, and it's a point well taken on gas prices. But when I dig into the CPI here, you know, I see the, the index for butter and margarine, margarine up 26.3%. That, that's huge. Dental costs, highest since 1995, is the only thing that is going to bring down prices like this is a recession in this country. Look, I think if you look under the hood, uh, you, see, uh, you see a lot, right? Meat prices down this month, uh, the price of eggs uh, down this month. Overall, food at home, uh, the food that you buy in a grocery store, uh, some moderation from the increase from last month. Uh, and if you look in commodity markets, again, to the, to the fact that this is backward-looking data, since June, you've seen, for example, a 30% decline in the global price of wheat. But look, none of that matters at the end of the day for typical families who come into a grocery store. And the bottom line is prices are too high when they're buying groceries or they're buying gas. And that's why I will come back. We need to take action. This president is focused on taking action wherever we can to lower prices for consumers. Congress has on its plate right now ways to do so. We talk about legislation that would lower the cost of prescription drugs, lower the cost of utility bills that families uh, pay. Why that matters? A typical family at the end of the month, if they're paying less on prescription drugs, if their utility bills have come down because we've provided long-term incentives for cleaner but also cheaper American energy, that's going to provide some relief to those families that are having uh, to pay too much. So look, there's a different pictures. We are seeing some, uh, uh, some uh, food goods come down, uh, others too high. But at the end of the day, what we should be doing is acting to bring down costs for consumers. 
Headline CPI rose 9.1% in the month, raising fears in the markets of a more aggressive pace of rate hikes from the Federal Reserve. Let's bring Yahoo Finance's Brian Chung on this. Brian, double-barreled double -barreled question one, what drove some of these increases and what are the implications for the Fed's next move? Yeah, so let's start off with the first bit of that. Again, if we unpack the numbers that we got about 30 minutes ago from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you can see on a year-over-year -year basis, prices increased in America by 9%. 0.1% above the street's estimates of 8.8%, so a hotter than expected report. Again, that's the hottest pace that we've seen since November of 1981. On a month over month basis, prices increased by 1.3%. Now, the Fed might argue, let's take a look at the core CPI, which strips out those more volatile components, like, for example, food and energy. And when you take out those elements, you do see a lower inflation report of 5.9% on a year over year basis, 0.7% on a month over month basis. But of course, you're going to have a lot of Americans saying, well, food and energy are the most important parts of my uh, daily consumption. So why would we strip that out? And indeed, when you do look at the prices of gasoline, fuel oil, things that Americans were spending a lot of money on in the month of June, you did see increases on a month over month basis, 11.2% on gasoline, fuel oil, did decline by 1%. Food, though, increased by 1%. Uh, you take a look at some other components of the CPI as well. Interesting to see the reopening play. Actually saw some prices decline. Hotels and motels down over 3%. Airline fares, car and truck rentals down about 2%. But take a look at owner's equivalent rent. This has been an argument for the more delayed bleed into higher inflation, increasing by 0.7%. That shows an acceleration, actually, of inflation in what is a very large percentage of the average household expenditure, guys. Is there anything that we can extrapolate this to really show where consumers are, are pushing back on the prices that they do have to pay right now? Yeah, certainly. I mean, there is demand destruction in some of those larger durable items. When you take a look at TVs, for example, declining by 2.3% on a month over month basis in this report. But again, you look at that headline number. Yes, you can maybe make it look a little bit better by taking a look at the core number. But it is still hot, whether or not you look at a core reading or a headline reading. So in, across the board, there is still a lot of demand. A lot of uh, pe you know companies that are supplying either services or goods are continuing to raise prices as of the month of June. But keep in mind, the price declines that we saw, at least in what you see at the pump, didn't start to happen until a few weeks ago. So that really isn't reflected in this June report. That's a reason why you have some economists saying the July report could show signs of perhaps some easing. But look, from the report we got 30 minutes ago, you're not seeing that quite yet. Well, and I'm also curious, not just are we going to see some easing in gasoline itself, but then the feed through to everything else, because gasoline is a factor and oil is a factor in so many of these other costs, right? Obviously, they have implications for airline fares. They have implications for food in terms of delivering the food and the prices that, that are being charged. So so we know we're already seeing prices of the pump go down. How quickly does that tend to filter through into other stuff? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lag effect to all of this, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the first thing that you'll start to see and probably the more most accurate real-time number that we get, which is not all that real-time because this report comes out about a month of a lag, right, is in the gasoline and oil prices, right? Because that has the bleed through to everything else. If oil prices get a little bit cheaper, that makes the input costs for businesses a lot cheaper as well. But that's not going to happen overnight, even after we've seen the price declines in the beginning uh, parts of July, for example. You might not see that impact into other other types of non-oil categories until the later months of this year. In the same way that you're seeing some impacts from this inflation report that are actually increasing, providing more upward pressure, not start to reflect themselves until the summer months of this year, right? Again, I was talking about owner's equivalent rent. You didn't see that tick up until really the middle and the beginning of this year, even though people were saying and anecdotally providing evidence that they were paying more for mortgages, paying more for their rent at the beginning or at the end of last year. So again, this really paints a very difficult picture for the Federal Reserve, which got, gets at the second part of your question, which I totally ignored. Thanks Brian, for not forgetting. I appreciate I did. <laughs> and you're starting to see that the Fed is going to be under more pressure to break the credibility promise that they've already made in the last meeting when they said we're going to go by 50 or 75 basis points. You have markets now pricing in. I just checked a few minutes ago a 30% chance of a 1% or 100 bips, as the smart people like to call it, interest rate <laughs> increase at the end of this month. Again, that's doubting what the Fed has said so far. And that's very much understandable when you say, well, this inflation print was much higher than expected. Wouldn't that require higher interest rates to try to take that demand down? When do you 
When is the Fed blackout period? Because now I'm thinking back to that journal story that came just before the last Fed meeting where they floated a higher pace of rate hikes. Do you think we could see something like that? Come yeah, so we're not in the blackout period right now. So there's period. no reason why a Fed official or even Jay Powell himself can't come out in the next, let's say, few days and say, hey, you know, here's our reading on the inflation report. We're going to do this at the end of the month. Uh, the blackout period does, however, begin at the beginning of next week because the next policy setting announcement is going to be on the 27th as scheduled. So they'll stop speaking around essentially Saturday uh, through the nine days after that period. Uh, now, again, we don't have any scheduled remarks. The only other Fed governor that we're expected to hear from is from Fed Governor uh, Chris Waller tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. That's definitely going to be one to watch in response to this. But again, all the commentary leading up to today has been it's either 50 basis points or 75 basis points. Philly Fed President Pat Harker said that on our show a few weeks ago. That hasn't changed for anyone. Does, that, does this report change that? We'll have to see. And we have University of Michigan confidence on Friday, which is also going to be. That was a big part of the pivot for the June meeting. Yeah, so we'll see what that shows. Certainly. If BIPs are what the part, smart people are saying right now, I'm going to start using that everywhere. <laughs> there Sports you go. games, Good move. Wah -wah, Good move. Anywhere. <laughs> bars. BIPs. BIPs. You guys are going to get these BIPs. How many, right. By how many BIPs has uh, all of, has your, have your eggs gone up, for example? Many BIPs. Many uh, BIPs. All we, the BIPs. We can check that. We can check that. See eggs BIPs. went up by, uh, let's see. Uh, 0.3% month over month. Still bips. 30 bips. bips. Some, some people say beeps. Uh, that's a Jared Blakery special, beeps. Uh, we're going to have yeah. to workshop that one. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Brian Chung, joining us here on the day to break down all things CPI.